Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, guys, to another um, stream from the Thought Adventure podcast. Today we have a special one where um, we are going to be seeing Jake Brancatella and Khalil Hamdani debate um, their positions or their creedal positions uh, um, and uh, and basically uh, try to defend it against one another. So um, we first want to thank, uh, sorry, uh, Muzzy Buzz for his super chat. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. And uh, let me... Uh, first begin by introducing Jake, and then I'll tell you what the format of the debate is going to be, and then I'll pass it on to Dr. Javad, who's uh, the second moderator today, and then we'll get right into it. So, um, yep, so give me one second. All right, so uh, Jake Brancatella is a former Catholic, and he's a convert to Islam. He has a BA in philosophy. And his study and his research revolves around epistemology and metaphysics uh, and uh, Christian doctrines like the core of Christian doctrines like the Trinity and the Incarnation, as well as inter and intra creedal discussions, which is, of course, closely related to today's uh, debate. And he has a YouTube channel. You guys can check it out. It's called The Muslim Metaphysician. He's quite known. So, um, uh, this intro is just a formality and uh, i'm going to pass it on right now to dr uh, javad and then we'll start with the uh, debate inshallah all right thank you uh, dr khalil andani is an intellectual historian and philosopher of islam specializing in quranic studies islamic theology and philosophy sufism and ismailism he holds two master's degrees and a phd in islamic studies from harvard university he is currently an assistant professor of religion at augustana college Dr. Andani's dissertation on the concept of revelation in Sunni and Shia Islam was awarded the best PhD dissertation award by the Foundation for Iranian Studies. He is currently uh, converting this into his first book. Dr. Andani has published numerous peer-reviewed articles in several Islamic studies journals and volumes. He also maintains an active social media presence on Twitter, YouTube, and Clubhouse, where he focuses on public education about Islam. Uh, before we proceed any further, can we just make sure, um, I think there was an issue about the uh, YouTube comments. Can we open them up, make sure they're open to everyone, not just subscribers? Uh, as far as I know, they are. Is, um, Abdurrahman, you're muted. So I don't know about the, like, I think this subscribers thing has been going on for a while, right? Um Wait, has this issue been brought up? Because I, because I'm, I'm just hearing it right now. But yeah, then basically, I, I all you need to do that. is, yeah, all you need to do is subscribe. It's always been like that. All you need to do is subscribe, and then five minutes or ten minutes. I don't know what the exact amount of time is. After that, you can start commenting. So I think that's always been uh, on the channel. But I don't know. Did somebody did somebody bring this up? Because I'm not aware of it. No, I didn't know anything. But then about th that's that's it's always been like that on the channel. So. Um, uh, so who, who anybody can comment doesn't anybody can just press the subscribe button and then just start commenting commenting yeah, you can five minutes unsubscribe after afterwards i guess yeah exactly and you then you can unsubscribe if you don't want to stay, stay subscribed but it's 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 a new feature on relatively new feature on youtube and a lot of people have been doing it so um so yeah i think people anybody who wants to subscribe can subscribe i just want to uh tell you guys uh, about the format of today's debate so um there's going to be 20 minute openings from each side jake is starting and then there are going to be 20 minute rebuttals uh, uh, on each side as well. And then five minute rebuttals followed by 15 minutes of cross examinations each and then 10 minutes closing each. So that's the format. And since Jake is starting, Jake, once you're ready, I am going to start my timer right here. And you just. Um, you just Rahman, I got a question for you. Yeah. Rahman. Is there any way that you sure. can open it up right now for comments only because it's already going to be your audience. Um, so it, it is another disincentive for somebody to comment. Um, so if you could open up, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it. I can't make that decision like on my own, but then uh, I don't, I don't see the I problem. Don't, I don't care. I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> I, I don't, I wouldn't know how to do it either. Like Riyadh, if you're Riyadh, if you're hearing us right now, you can do it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, Riyadh, I don't mind. Here, I don't really care. Yeah. Like you, you can, you can open it up. But I, I, as in, in, in the sense that like all the, the, the streams we've had, we've had, all sides commenting because people simply subscribe and comment and whoever wants to unsubscribe later can unsubscribe. I didn't even but know if you, if that you want... was a thing to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's recent, but uh, let, 
I, we we can try to uh, like reach out right now and make him remove it. Um, okay, so how about we start? And I'll be working on this as, and I'll try to <laughs> reach uh, the out. But Jake, um, uh, as long as it's not a distraction, you let me know when you're ready, and I can start the timer. Yeah, hold on. Or do you, or do you, do you want to take care of this first? I don't care. I don't know anything about this issue. So it's up to Khalil. Okay, so, if, he just, okay. if he feels uncomfortable, then we'll wait. I mean, I don't know. Okay, okay, it's done. It's done. It's already done. Okay, so we can, we can, we can, we can go ahead right now. Okay? Okay. All right. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, so... Okay, you guys able to see that? Yep. Okay. So, well, guys, so when, when, thing, I move, right? when I move, this, when, I, when I move it, it, it moves with the as well, correct? You can see the title now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. So, I'll one last thing question. for the people in the chat, please keep it respectful because it there's already already been comments that um, that uh, are like inappropriate. We want to keep it civil, both like in the discussion itself and in the chat, and we will ban or block or you know time out anybody on any side who is disrespe disrespectful in the way they're commenting. So, um, I mean, to the best of our ability. So, uh, yeah, please keep it respectful, Jake. Whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, Abdurrahman, just make sure you mute yourself, bro, because I can. Yep, yep, um, yep. I'm about, I'm about to. Okay. Right. Hey, go ahead, Jake. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Was salatu was salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The subject of today's debate is Tawheed and the oneness of Allah. I will be defending the ethity position, and Mr. Andani will be defending Islamic philosophy, and more specifically, the Ismaili Neoplatonic model. However, as you soon will see, Khalil's position is not only false, but there's nothing Islamic about it. Now, let me explain the structure of my opening statement. I will start by outlining what the ethity creed is and the reasons for holding to it, and next I will provide and explain what Khalil's position is and provide reasons for rejecting it. So what is ethity creed? Well, we affirm what the Quran and Sunnah affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we do not attempt to go further. We accept what has come to us in the Quran and the authentic Sunnah without rejecting the text, without tajseem or making Allah like his creation, nor do we create esoteric interpretations of the text that no sensible person could derive from the text alone. We do not seek to use alien philosophies and metaphysical notions that are not derived from the text in order to derive our interpretations of the text itself. This is primarily because we are certain in our belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that he has sent the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam with the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet, which is obligatory to affirm and to follow. We have no doubt about the truthfulness of the guidance that has reached us, and so we accept it as it comes. We seek to have our beliefs and creedal affirmations in line with what the Prophet والسلام, has taught and what he has brought and taught to his companions and what the righteous from the earliest generations affirmed and taught as well. This is quite simple, straightforward and easy to understand. However, in order to understand the creed, you must be familiar with the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. So let's take a look at some examples, starting with to understand Tawheed. Let's start with Surah Ikhlas. In the Quran, chapter 112, verses 1 to 4, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, He, Allah, is one. Allahu Samad. Allah is the one who depends on nothing, but everything depends on Him. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ He begets not, nor is He begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there is none equivalent to Him. So Allah is one, independent, does not beget, nor is He begotten, and there is none equivalent to Him. But that's not all. Allah is the one without any partners, children, or anything else that you can think of, as he has not in need of anyone or anything. 
Again, in the Quran, chapter 59, verses 22 to 24, he is Allah, other than whom there is no deity, nowhere of the unseen and the witness. He is the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. He is Allah, other than whom there is no deity, the sovereign, the pure, the perfection, the bestower of faith, the overseer, the exalted in might, the compeller, the superior. Exalted is Allah above whatever they associate with him. He is Allah. The creator, the inventor, the fashioner, to him belong the best names. Whatever is in the heavens and earth is exalting him, and he is the exalted in might, the wise. Notice that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belong the best names, the creator and the one who knows all things. We believe Allah when he states in the Quran that he created Adam alayhi salam with his own hands and that he is above the throne. However, this does not mean that we believe Allah has physical limbs, nor do we say that he is encompassed by space. We affirm these texts on their apparent meanings and that it is obligatory to believe in them, not seeking to reject them without making tet wheel or seeking false interpretations, while at the same time not liking in the law to his creation. At the same time, we are not anti-reason. We believe that reason is a gift from Allah to mankind and that using it, is properly, it, using it properly is praiseworthy. We do not believe that the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah can or do contradict reason. However, we are highly skeptical of metaphysical principles that are alien to the Quran and Sunnah or even contradict them and at times are used to construct theologies that are not in agreement with the text. On the other hand, reason can be employed as an, apologet an, as an apologetic tool in defense of the Quran and Sunnah. This includes rational argumentation for the existence of God that is derived from the text itself. We can speak more about these issues in detail later if need be. I will now turn to my opponent's position and present three main arguments against it. My first argument is meant to establish an internal inconsistency, both in Khalil's methodology and specific theological positions. He is claiming to defend Islamic philosophy in the debate title and adopts the methodology of the philosophers in several key positions that they hold to. However, he is simultaneously claiming to defend Ismaili Neoplatonism, conceived of by such figures as Abu Yaqub Sijistani and Nasr al-Khusra. The problem is that the methodology and position of the philosophers, such as Ibn Sina, is diametrically opposed to that of classical Ismaili theology. My examples are aimed at demonstrating this fact with the intention of exhorting Khalil to take a stand on these key issues as to absolve himself from these contradictions. If he cannot do so, he will fail to defend his position in this debate as his position currently constructed is contradictory. First example, can the existence of God be proven through reason alone? Khalil says yes, and he will probably give some form of the contingency argument in his opening statement to support this. However, his classical Ismaili texts say that God cannot be proven by the intellect alone. For example, Nasruddin Atusi states in his text Paradise of Submission, and I quote, As for proving the existence of God Almighty, human beings cannot establish such a proof, because he, the exalted one, is in reality the founder of all established things. Anyone, including Khalil, who says he can prove his existence, therefore claims to have comprehended the reality of the identity of the transcendent being. But such comprehension by created beings is a supreme form of absurdity. And since comprehension of him is impossible, the proof which they wish to establish is equally impossible. Close quote. The famous Hajjah, or proof of the Imam, Nasr al-Khusral states in his text Between Reason and Revelation, and I quote, the, doc the true doctrine of oneness lies in interpretation of the book in the sacred law, not in some dark interior of the community, as this group claims and as we find in their pronouncements. For this reason, the emissary of God called people to God's oneness by God's command, not by the command of the intellect. They accept re religion as a matter of individual opinion so that they may practice speculation. Thus, God says, say, it is revealed to me that your God is one God. Are you going to surrender? Close quote. Notice that knowledge of God is by his command, not by reason. <clears throat> Well-respected scholar Wilfred Madlong in his article entitled The Prophetic Chain and the God Beyond Being states, and I quote, Characteristically, Ismaili theology did not attempt to offer a proof of God, that first concern of any rational theology. 
A rational proof of what is beyond reason and being was evidently futile, nor was there any need for it. For God, Abu Yaqub affirmed, is more certain than everything certain. This was a certainty which becomes evident to the human mind only by revelation, close quote. So, is Khalil an Ismaili that rejects the position of the scholars he is claiming to defend, or has he in fact left his religion to follow Ibn Sina? Is God the necessary being? Classical Ismaili texts say no, but Khalil says yes. Nasr al-Khusraw in Knowledge and in Liberation states, and I quote, Under it, there are the necessary existent, which is the universal intellect, not God and the contingent existent, that is the universal soul, which is under the intellect, close quote. So the necessary being is clearly identified as the universal intellect. Commenting on this passage in an Ismaili publication, Parvez Morwedj says, and I quote, nor is he, Khusra, a follower of Ibn Sina, for whom God is the necessary existent, whereas Nasser places God above the necessary existent. Nasr al-Husral presents two remarkable ontological doctrines in this work. One is a radical development of the Neoplatonic idea that existence cannot be attributed to God and that unlike the Avicennan tradition, the necessary existent is the universal intellect and not the ultimate being analogous to the God of monotheism. Close quote. Ash-Shahristani in his text dedicated to refuting Ibn Sina states, and I quote, the method of demonstration for Ibn Sina and whoever follows him, including Khalil, comes apart because division does not apply to the equivocal. On the other hand, the procedure of the prophets upon them be peace is in accordance with what we will report. So we say the creator exalted as he is too well known for his existence to be pointed to by anything. And the recognition of him exalted as he is true innate predisposition, fitra, close quote. Once again, is God the necessary being proven by the contingency argument as conceived of by Ibn Sina, or is he beyond the necessary being and only known through the fitra or the imam as the Ismailis claim? Khalil needs to decide whether or not he is an Ismaili in this debate or a follower of the philosophers in order to even have a chance in this debate because as it stands, his position is contradictory. Is creation a necessary consequence of God's essence or is it a free act of God? Classical Ismaili texts say that it is a free act of God, and Khalil says that it is necessary. Asajistani in the 15th Wellspring titled, and I quote, that asking why God created the world is impossible and absurd, states, the rule has been handed down to us that it is impossible and absurd to inquire into the reason of something, the very manner of whose being is incomprehensible. However, it is generally agreed that no one has ever understood the manner by which the maker brought the universe into being. Although some scholars did insist that how the maker brought it into being is by command, they did not understand the manner of that command itself. But since their views are in agreement that the comprehension of the manner by which the universe has its being is outside the realm of possibility, inquiring into the reason of its existence is even more absurd and even further beyond inference. Perhaps the reason of it lies within the question of its manner, and thus understanding the reason is difficult because its manner is hidden. Close quote. Madlon confirms this in the same article cited earlier when he states, and I quote, More significantly, however, these changes reflected the volitional nature, the liberty of the act of creation as conceived in the Holy Quran and Islamic tradition, in contrast to the emanational doctrine of the philosophers, with the same motive Ismaili theology expressly denied against the philosophic tradition that God is the first cause. The basic error of Ibn Sina and his followers in this question is that they view the world as an emanation from God, which is necessitated by his essence or that. Thus, they describe God in relation to the universe primarily as its necessitator. The world then appears as an accidental, unintentional consequence of his essence. God is, however, in relation to the world, primarily its giver of existence, not of necessity, and revealed scripture describes his acting towards it with terms like option, ikhtiar, will, irada, creation, hulk, command, amr, and reign, mulk. Close quote. So, once again, is Khalil following the necessitarianism of Ibn Sina and the philosophers, or the view that creation is a free act of God as the Ismailis claim? Khalil needs to get himself out of this contradictory position to even have a chance in this debate. Is the God of the philosophers and Mu'tazila the same God of Ismaili theology? It is clear that they aren't. 
But Khalil tries to make it seem like their notion of divine simplicity is the same, even though it clearly isn't. Nasr al-Khusraw states, and I quote, to posit one essence with six different attributes is not true Tawheed. Quite the opposite. It is to posit a multiplicity, nor can it be true Tawheed to ascribe preacherly qualities to God. On the contrary, that is anthropomorphism. This group never sees anything better than themselves and indeed fancy themselves to be God. That is extreme error, close quote. Khalil himself in a published academic article commenting on this passage states, and I quote, Nasser concludes his critique of the Montezalites by accusing them of the very anthropomorphism that they sought to avoid. Khalil himself admits that Nasser al-Khosrau views the, the position of those who believe God has multiple attributes identical to his essence as shirk, which includes the Montezala and his so-called philosopher friends. In fact, Nasr al-Din Atusi says the philosophers are fuel for hell in his work Contemplation in Action. He states, and I quote, Firstly, as the philosophers have explained, absolute certainty cannot be achieved by reasoning from effect to cause. But since the highest of no state of knowledge for the speculative rationalists is to know cause from effect, no rationalist can come to know God. Surely you and that which you worship apart from God are fuel for hell. You shall go down to it. Such is the ultimate stage the rationalist reaches in his quest for perfection. Close quote. So has Khalil left the Ismaili faith and is now following the methodology and theology of the philosophers? Or is he going to condemn the philosophers and say that they are anthropomorphists that cannot know God and are fuel for hell? These are questions that need answers to. Khalil's view and my second argument is that Khalil's God is not the God of the Quran. Khalil does not believe that Allah is the direct creator of the heavens and the earth. He does not believe that Allah is all-knowing, all-powerful, and perfect. In fact, his books state that to ascribe such names and attributes to God is shirk and anthropomorphism. Nasr al-Din Atusi describes the Ismaili God as, and I quote, He cannot be attributed with cause or effect, existence or non-existence, temporality or eternity necessity or contingency, nor any of the other kinds of opposition. He is beyond any attribute by which something could be qualified, whether it be non-existent or existent, negative or positive, relative or absolute, verbal or in meaning. He is beyond all this and also beyond the beyond and so forth, close quote. Nasr al-Khusra claims it is polytheism to ascribe knowledge and power to Allah when he states, and I quote, it is wrong to ascribe the opposites of such attributes, such as knowledge and power to him. Glory be to him. He is exalted on the grounds that these two are creaturely quali qualities. The so-called theologians of this community have plunged into grievous error in their inquiry in ascribing their own fine qualities to God and in declaring him devoid of their bad qualities. And for this very reason, they have fallen into polytheism, close quote. So anyone in the audience, if you're listening, who thinks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God is all-knowing and all-powerful is a polytheist, according to Khalil and Ismaili theology. Khalil would like us to believe that when Allah tells us in the Quran that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and the creator of all things, us Muslims have just simply always misunderstood these verses. My third and final argument is that Khalil's concept of God contradicts reason. His God cannot be known and therefore cannot be worshipped. Remember that the Ismailis cannot prove their God exists. This is because they believe God does not exist and is beyond reason. Paul Walker in his book on the Ismaili Hujja al-Kirmani describes the problem as such, and I quote, Languages cannot signify God as he really is, since the signifier must have a referent that exists and can be known. God, however, is unknown. One cannot signify with language or with abstractions in the mind something that is unknown. Therefore, one simply cannot speak about God, close quote. So listen closely. Every single time that Khalil opens his mouth to speak about God in this debate, I will remind him of the fact that nothing, he says, actually refers to God at all. This debate is already over, folks. Khalil should simply leave his mic on mute as he cannot even speak about God whatsoever. Paul Walker again states, and I quote, those who have proposed such an absolute view of God, as for example, to say with the Neoplatonists that he is beyond both knowledge and being, have been regarded almost necessarily as mystics, at least in theology. Indeed, it has been hard to discover a rational and non-mystical yet religiously satisfying explanation for such a paradox as human worship of an unknown God. 
It should be clear that Asajistani offers no new method for knowing the unknowable God. He never really concerned himself with the demonstration of how he knows the unknown God to exist. This problem, which really has no logical solution, of course, was for him secondary, close quote. So Khalil's God does not exist, cannot be known, and cannot be worshipped. On this basis alone, his position doesn't even get off the ground and really shouldn't even be considered. So Khalil needs to explain to us whether or not he is still an Ismaili or has he apostatized in favor of the creed of the philosophers. Secondly, he needs to explain to us why we should reject the plain reading of the Qur'an and the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, all-knowing and all-powerful. Lastly, Khalil must explain to us how we can know and worship an unintelligible God beyond existence and intellect. Khalil believes that Allah is not the creator of the world. He is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. He is not perfect. He is not all wise and that he only has the ability to perform one action. Imagine that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only has the ability to perform one action. He couldn't do anything else even if he wanted to. Instead, he attributes all of the beautiful names and attributes to two other eternal beings known as the universal intellect and the universal soul. And get this, they aren't even mentioned in the Qur'an. Simply and straightforwardly, this is not Islam. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from Khalil. Okay, thank you, Jake, for that opening. Um, so right now, Khalil, are, are you ready? Um, uh, Jake, can you, uh, Khalil, you're, you're, you're muted. Here. I'm just, uh, yeah. I'm just sharing. Can you put my uh, screen on this, on the screen and then I'll, I'll run. Yeah. The... Jake, are you able to s switch your, yourself and Dr. Khalil, uh, the, the, on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Great. Okay. So, uh, whenever you're re one second. Um, yeah, okay, so whenever you're ready, Khalil, you can just uh, give me the shout, inshallah. Okay. And Abdul Rahman, if you could go to mute as well, please. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Thank you to Jake and our host for inviting me. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not a debater. Uh, I'm an academic intellectual historian. Uh, but for this occasion, I've made an exception because my opponent has a habit of misconstruing and takfiring any Muslim who holds to certain beliefs, including many Sunnis, Twelvers, Ismaili, Sufis, and Philosopha. Uh, now he's takfired me out of my own uh, community, which is an interesting move to make. So uh, today, uh, I will defend the Tawheed of Islamic philosophy, including the Tawheed of the Ismaili tradition, and my defense will include a critique of Jake's authority beliefs, you know, without takfiring the authorities out of Islam. Now, Tawheed means that God is absolutely one and absolutely unique. God is the independent, necessary reality. He is unique, eternal, timeless, and the creator of everything that is other than him. I will show that Islamic philosophy fully upholds this view of Tawheed, while the authority creed utterly fails at Tawheed. Now, in Islamic philosophy, Ismailis included, we maintain that Allah is absolutely one, simple, without any parts or multiple aspects within him, and that he is timeless and immaterial, and that God has no similarity to his creation. And God is a creator of everything through a created hierarchy of intermediaries, beginning with the first creation of Allah, known as the first intellect, the pen or the nur of Muhammad, and then through the second creation of Allah, known as the universal soul, the second intellect or the guarded tablet. And through the mediation of the first creation and the second creation, Allah creates and sustains our universe. Thus, Islamic philosophy maintains that Allah is absolutely one, absolutely unique, and absolutely dissimilar to his creation. On the other hand, my Athari opponent, Jake, does not affirm pure Tawheed. He believes that Allah contains multiple distinct entitative attributes that are not identical to himself. So in the Athari view, Allah is composed of numerous uncreated finite entities like you see on this circle pie chart diagram. 
Furthermore, the authorities believe that Allah has attributes that do resemble his creation in some respect. He exists within time. He has two hands, two feet, fingers. He's above a throne. He comes down every night. He even appears in human form. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, the Uthari creed will fail to register as Tawheed. Now, Islamic philosophy is a broad tradition known inside Islam as Hikmah, known in the West as Islamic Neoplatonism. And in the worldview of Islamic philosophy, Allah, who is absolutely simple and eternal, creates and sustains everything through the first intellect, the first creation. Now, this particular worldview is widespread in the history of Islam across Sunni and Shia traditions. Despite all their other differences, you have a big tent of Muslims who believe in this Neoplatonic worldview. These include Sunnis in the Ibn Sina tradition, Persian Sufis like Ghazali and Rumi, the Ibn Arabi tradition, South Asian Sunnis. There are even some Hanbali Sunnis that believe in this Neoplatonic worldview. So this is not an exclusively Ismaili thing, despite what my opponent says. The greatest Islamic metaphysicians held to a Neoplatonic worldview or Hikmah worldview of reality. Meanwhile, the Uthari creed that Jake is defending is actually the most anti-rational and the most anti-metaphysical creed in the very history of Islam. Now, my opponent has said, for example, that if you hold to this Neoplatonism that I've described that you're not a Sunni, he said that. Now, this is patently false. It doesn't even pass the test of history. Let me give you guys one example of how widespread Islamic Neoplatonism is. We have a text called Hidayat al-Hikmah by al-Abhari. This text teaches that Allah is absolutely simple. He has no parts or real attributes. And that Allah is the creator of the eternal first intellect and ten other intellects. Now, this text, Hidayat al-Hikmah, was taught across the Islamic madrasa system in the Ottoman, Safavid, Qajar, Mughal empires for the past 700 years. And 200 Muslim scholars, Sunni and Shia, wrote commentaries on this text. So when Jake has said that if you have these Neoplatonic beliefs, you're a kafir and a mushrik, I want Jake to tell us whether he thinks that madrasas for 700 years were teaching kufr to Muslims and whether 200 Muslim scholars have been writing commentaries on kufr and shirk for the past 700 years. Now, in this opening statement, I will offer 10 arguments to show that the Tawheed of Islamic philosophy, Ismailis included, is established by reason and revelation, while the Uthari creed is surely not. My first five arguments will target the logical incoherence and anthropomorphism of the Uthari Hanbali creed, and my next five arguments will show the truth of the position of Islamic philosophy, which entails the falsity of the Uthari creed. Now, what are our criteria for true Tawheed? Firstly, the correct Tawheed must be proven rationally, and it must be logically coherent and metaphysically coherent. So it has to be demonstrated. It cannot just be asserted. Second, the true Tawheed must be consistent with the correct understanding of the Holy Quran and Sunnah. The correct understanding, which is not the same as a personal understanding from Jake or the Salaf or whoever it is. Because the Prophet per Sunni and Shia sources said that the Book of God, the correct understanding of the Quran is only with his family, the Ahl Bayt. Argument one. The Hanbali Athari Creed forbids philosophical and logical arguments. It's completely forbidden. We have a contemporary Hanbali authority, Sheikh Yusuf bin Sadiq, who has said that logical proofs is prohibited and kalam is prohibited in the Hanbali madhab, which the Athari Creed comes from. Ahmed ibn Hanbal has said that kalam is rejected and forbidden. That means you cannot use reason to prove the existence of God and you cannot use reason to attack anybody else. So Jake, by just coming to a debate, has violated the Uthari Creed. And if he really follows the Uthari Creed, he should withdraw from the debate right now. So if you are a true blue Uthari, you should refrain from any sort of arguments that you're bringing in the debate. Uh, because by making any argument against anyone else's position, the Uthari has refuted themselves. And you should just back out of the debate and withdraw immediately. Argument two, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the imam of the Hanbali Athari creed, is a known anthropomorphist. We know this because we have the creeds of Ahmed from Hanbali sources. In this creed, he says that Allah has two feet, that Allah laughs, he has fingers, he comes down from the heaven, he puts his foot in the fire. All of these statements from Ahmed, including that God has a loin, come from from Sunni hadith that the authorities have to take in the apparent meaning. And Ahmed himself says, we take all the hadith according to the apparent meaning. Well, guess what? The apparent meaning of all of these hadith and creedal statements results in a Zeus-like God, which 
quite frankly, is deeply disturbing. I don't know how anybody thinks this passes for Tawheed. And this is not just my opinion. The academic Dr. Wesley Williams has said that Ahmed ibn Hanbal was an anthropomorphist, and he believed that the divine does have human-like features that I've put on the slide. Now, let me give you an example of how crass this anthropomorphism is. You have a hadith that the Hanbalis were famous for narrating, and believing in hadith is part of the Athari creed. So this hadith, the Prophet allegedly says that he saw Allah in the form of a young man with curly hair. This is what the hadith says. And the Hanbalis believe in this hadith, and the Atharis have to affirm this hadith. Here are the receipts. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, according to multiple witnesses, validated this hadith as true. The Hanbali authorities like Qadi Abu Yala, Darakutni said the hadith is true. Even Ibn Taymiyyah said this hadith is sahih. So Jake, if you follow the Athari creed, fine. I want you to admit that you believe that Allah has the form of a young man who is beardless and who has curly hair. Just admit it if you are really an Athari. Otherwise, you should denounce the Athari creed immediately. Now, just to be clear, this belief that Allah is a young man with, with without a beard, this comes from Christianity. It does not come from the Quran and Sunnah, and this is what the research has shown. So the Athari view of Tawheed and some of these hadith that it's based on is not from the Quran and Sunnah. It's from other religions. Argument three. Now, my opponent already has to affirm the apparent meaning of everything, all the bullet points that you see, that you see here, because this is what the Sunni hadith say. Okay, if he does not want to affirm the apparent meaning, he can be like the rest of Ahl al Sunnah and do Tawil. That is, affirm a metaphorical meaning, the non Zahiri meaning. The problem with this is that the Athari books are very clear. Ibn Qudama says multiple times, we do not interpret anything with a Tawil that opposes the apparent meaning. So, metaphorical interpretation of God's eyes, God's face, God's beardless human form, God's foot. That is not an option for the Athari. So Jake must either affirm the apparent meaning of all these things, in which case his Tawheed fails, or what Jake is going to do, I'm predicting, is he's going to do something called Tafweed. He's going to reject the apparent meaning, and he's going to reject the Tawil. And this is known as Tafweed al-Mahna. The problem with Tafweed al-Mahna is that it leads to a clear contradiction. When you do tafweed al-mahna, you deny the apparent meaning, and then you deny the opposite of the apparent meaning. And this is a clear logical contradiction, and it means that the tafweed position of the authorities is completely incoherent. Now, if Jake finds a way to get past the logical problem of the authority, which is what this is called, then he has another problem. So if you say that you do tafweed and you don't know the meaning of God coming down at night, you don't know the meaning of his two hands, what you're basically saying is that there is no meaning to these statements in the Quran and the Sunnah that are accessible to humans. And that turns parts of the Quran and Sunnah into gibberish, something that has no truth value. Okay. Now the problem with this is according to Arabic grammarians, a statement only counts as kalam or speech if it is mufid, if it is meaningful, something that is not meaningful to people that is not kalam. So when the Athari does tafweed al-mahna, what they are doing is they are saying that the Quran and the Hadith are not kalam, which is a form of disbelief in the Quran as the kalam Allah. If something is not kalam, it cannot be kalam Allah. And this is why other Hanbali scholars like Hatim al-Hajj have come out against this tafweed al-mahna, which my opponent is probably going to do, because it would mean that the Prophet said all these things, and the Prophet himself doesn't even know what God's two hands are, and the Prophet doesn't know what God coming down at night means. Next argument. If the Athari comes and says either tafweed al-mahna, which I which is we don't know what it means, or if the Athari says we affirm it, but we don't know how, which is bila kaif, and only God knows how, well, this is an appeal to mystery. Okay, the Athari creed is an appeal to mystery. Now this is fine if you want to appeal to mystery, but then Jake, if you are a true blue Athari and you do tafweed al-mahna or tafweed al-kaif, fine. You should stop debating with Christians because the Christian Trinitarians, they do this tafweed al-mahna and tafweed al-kaif. Professor Wilmer says regarding the Trinity, we don't know why there could be or how there could be three persons in one God. And Stephen David says the Trinity is a mystery to us, but it's not a mystery to God. This is just a Christian form of tafweed. So if the other is going to do tafweed, fine, but then you need to cancel your debating career against the Christians because they can do exactly the same thing. Now, my opponent has made mention about the Quran and what the Quran says. Well, let's see what the Quran actually says, okay? Let's begin with Surat Al-Ikhlas. Kulhu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad. What does this mean? Well, what does Ahad mean? 
according to the widely held view in Sunni tafsir, as reported by Professor Lombard, the meaning of ha'ahad and the meaning of ahadiya is a absolute oneness that is unique and cannot be divided. That means Allah is absolutely simple, which is what the Islamic philosophers believe. The Atharis do not believe that Allah is absolutely simple. They believe that Allah has real distinct attributes that are different from one another and different from Allah's essence. And although Jake didn't say it in his slides, he has said it on his YouTube videos multiple times. So the God that the Atharis believe in is not Ahad, because Ahad means absolute simplicity. It's the same thing with Samad. What does Samad mean? Well, according to the Sunni tafsir tradition from Tabari and others, Samad refers to that reality which is one solid, unchangeable, and monolithic. A monolithic reality is an absolutely simple reality, but the Atharis don't believe that. The Islamic philosophers believe is that God is absolutely simple, but the Atharis have this weird thing. They say Allah's essence is uncreated, but it's not, it's not the same as Allah's uncreated foot, which is not the same as Allah's uncreated power. So the Athari God doesn't even meet the definition of Ahad or Samad. Furthermore, the Quran actually clearly teaches that God is absolutely simple and that God has no multiplicity within himself. How do we know this? Well, the Quran says that God is the creator of everything, every shay. The Quran says that every shay has been created as a pair. So every created thing contains zaujia or duality. The Quran says God is nothing like his creation. Laysa ka mitlihi shay'un. So God is absolutely dissimilar to everything in creation. And if everything in creation has duality, it means God cannot have any duality. But when the Athari comes and says that God has real entitative sifat that are distinct from his essence, the Athari has created duality within God because a sifa and mausuf are not identical. They're codependent on one another. And this is the same teaching that Imam Ali, the first Imam and the fourth Caliph of Sunnis, teaches. He says you have to deny God attributes, that is, real distinct attributes. Now, the Quran actually nowhere teaches the Uthari doctrine that God has real distinct attributes that are additional or distinct from his essence. What the Quran does talk about is the names of Allah, the descriptions, and the relations. But names, descriptions, and relations are not the same as ontological attributes. There is an Uthari tawil going on here that they're not admitting to. So where does the doctrine of real distinct attributes comes from? Which again, Jake holds to this doctrine. It actually comes from the Christian doctrine of the Trinity this is the finding of Harvard professor Henry Austin Wilson. And in fact, we can go into detail on this. We can show you, according to many, many sources, we know that the Christian Arabs defined the Son of God and the Holy Spirit as two eternal divine attributes, such as life and knowledge or knowledge and power. And the early proto authorities like Ibn Kulab learned this doctrine from the Christians and they transformed the Christian Son of God and Holy Spirit into Allah's uncreated attribute of X and Y. So the Uthari position on attributes doesn't come from the Quran and Sunnah, it comes from the Christian Trinity. Now, even if we apply reason to the Uthari doctrine of attributes, of real distinct attributes, this entire doctrine is going to collapse. Firstly, the Uthari say the attributes are not identical to God and they're not other than God. This violates logic. It violates the law of the excluded middle. But even if you get past that logical problem, the question we ask is this. If God's essence and his attributes are all mutually distinct, which is what Jake believes and what the Uthari's believe, we ask, is the essence and each attribute necessary in itself or dependent in itself? Now, here are the options. If you answer that the essence is dependent and the attributes are independent, you believe in multiple necessary beings, polytheism. If you say the attributes depend on the essence, so the attributes are dependent, the essence is independent, well, that is divine simplicity. There's only one necessary independent reality, which is God. Uh, so that's our position. If you say the essence and attributes are all independent necessary beings, that's more polytheism. And if you say they're all dependent contingent things, that's atheism. So the Uthari position on Tawheed is going to collapse into one of these four. And therefore, this view of Tawheed you know, cannot stand the ta this test of reason. Furthermore, when the Atharis say that God's attributes are distinct from one another and God's essence, what they are saying is that each divine attribute in being different from others is finite. Okay, something is finite if it is limited and it excludes things that are different from itself. So to say that God is infinite, but he's comprised of multiple finite attributes is a logical contradiction. You cannot have divine infinity composed of finite attributes. Furthermore, the Atharis affirm that God has two yads. Whatever yad means, he has two yads. Well, guess what? 
two is a quantitative arbitrary limit. Why does he have two yards? Why can't he have seven yards or a thousand yards? So when the authorities affirm in their creed that God has two hands or two yards, they're giving an arbitrary limit to God. And according to the Thought Adventure podcast that I've watched, anything with arbitrary limits is contingent, not necessary. So the Uthari concept of Tawheed posits a contingent God. Now, what is our position on attributes? Here's the thing. If attributes refer to distinct finite realities, which is what the authorities believe, then yes, of course, God is beyond attributes because God is one and infinite. So these finite distinct attributes like knowledge, power, life, and justice, these belong in creation, okay? When the Quran refers to God as all-knowing or all-living or all-powerful, we can affirm that, that he is, but the meaning of that is that God is the creator of life, knowledge, and power, not that God is the bearer of life, knowledge, and power. And there's a consensus between the philosophers, the Sufis, and the Ismailis on this point. There's actually consensus on this. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about creation. So in our view, God is the creator of everything. He is not limited by anything, but everything God does is in accordance with his own essence or his own nature. So because God is absolutely simple, he creates one direct creation. All the other creations are from him, but indirectly. And that one direct creation is called the first intellect. And the reason why is because if God has multiple aspects, then he would create multiple things. Because God is simple, he creates one thing directly. And this first creation must be eternal because God is eternal. God is not in time. I know Jake believes God is in time, but God is actually not in time. So God is always eternally creating the first intellect, and the first intellect depends upon God. So it is a, it is a creation, and it's an eternal creation. And in the Islamic tradition, and in the Quran and the Sunnah, the first intellect is affirmed. The first intellect is called the will by which God creates all things in Shia Hadith. The first intellect is called the Amr, the Kun Fayakun mentioned in the Quran. In the Hadith literature, the first intellect is called the pen. It says the first thing God created was the pen, and then he told the pen to write everything in creation. That's literally an intermediary. Before anything is created in its physical reality, it is written by the pen. So God does create everything through the pen or the first intellect. And, and, and these hadiths are in the Sunni and the Shia corpus, okay? So this is very clear then. I have launched today 10 arguments against the Uthari Creed. And each of these arguments that I've given is fatal to the Uthari Creed. So if Jake wants to stand a chance in this debate, I expect him to, number one, refute all 10 of my arguments. And number two, you have to give some rational demonstration for the Uthari Creed, which we haven't seen. As for the, 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 the things that Jake said, I will be rebutting all of his misstatements uh, in my first rebuttal. Thank you. Right on the buzzer. Abdurrahman, are you there? Jake, are you there? I, I apologize. I apologize. Um Jake, yeah, uh, are you are you ready for your first rebuttal? Um just one second. Okay. Okay, so this section, guys, is going to be a 10-minute rebuttals where Jake is going to start, and then Halil is going to have 10 minutes of his own. So um, I start timer as soon as you're ready, Jake. Yeah, I'm ready. Just, okay. Um, okay. Go ahead. Okay, one second. Let me just get my timer. Okay. All right, so that was a very interesting presentation from Khalil. Uh, he claims that he provided 10 arguments. So let's see what I could do in this, this 10 minutes to answer as much as I possibly can, even though his you know, apparent machine gun tactics show that he is classically put at an amateur debater. Now, he says that I have to tuck fear all these other scholars because everyone believes the exact same thing that Khalil does. No, and he also, I believe, mentioned uh, Abdul Qadir al Jalani. Well, let me let me read for you what he actually said. He said, "We believe that Allah constricts, expands, rejoices, loves, dislikes, becomes pleased, becomes angry, and abhors. He has two hands, and both of his hands are right. The hearts of his servants are between two of his fingers." And he is in the direction of Ulu. 
and he is established on the throne and is encompassing. The Prophet والسلام, approved the belief of the girl when he asked her, where is Allah? And she pointed to the heavens. The attribute of istiwa must be acknowledged without reinterpretation or tatwil. It is the settling of his ipsaity that above the throne, not in the form of sitting and touching as the corporealists and Karamites have said, not in the form of high status and greatness as the Esharis have said, and not in the form of seizing as the Mu'tazila have said. So I don't know where you're getting this idea, but he clearly, this sounds like ethity creed to me, not this uh, garbage that we've just heard for the past 20 minutes. And most of the time he, he couldn't, what, didn't even spend it uh, actually explaining his position in detail. But what we're going to see quite clearly is the fact of the matter is everyone on this debate is going to be on my side, not yours. Why? Because you are actually tech fearing everyone in your own text saying that we are all guilty of kufr and shirk if we apply the title of all-knowing and all-powerful to God. You believe that it actually refers to the intellect or in equivocal terms that it must mean in the sense of God creating knowledge and anyone else who believes otherwise, which you told me and you just said in your opening statement, actually, which I find very amusing that there's consensus on this point amongst the Sufis and the Ismailis and the philosophers. Wow, I wonder why if that is the case that Ashahristani and you compared my com composition or, or understanding of Tawheed, uh, explanation of Tawheed to um, the Trinity. But in fact, that's what your very scholars did about Ibn Sina. Let's see from Ashahristani himself, who wrote a whole entire text refuting Ibn Sina. What did he say? I say you stipulated three considerations in the essence of the necessary existence and glossed over each consideration with a proper meaning, each of which is not to be understood from the other. That is patent Trinitarianism and exalted be God above the third of three. This is not in slander, but the absurd implication of multiplicity in his essence in respect of one consideration and another. So Ibn Sina is being accused by Ashahristani, who you affirm as an Ismaili scholar, as saying that he is guilty of affirming a trinity. Now, it's interesting that you would say that they have the exact same position. Now, is this only Jake's uh, understanding of the text? Well, we see that, not. no, it, it's not just Jake's understanding of the text. Because we have an article from Frank Griffel himself, or I'm sorry, not Frank Griffel, from Madlong himself, where he says, Ibn, Ibn Sina's doctrine that God is an essence under three aspects, intelligence, intellecting, and intelligible, is equally repudiated by Ashahristani as implying a trinity in God similar to the trinity affirmed by the Christians. So what Khalil wants to do is he wants to make it seem like my position is very restricted and only held by a limited few people, and that his view is very expansive and held by virtually everyone except my group. It's exactly the opposite, my friend. When it comes to Sunnis, when it comes to the fact that we have the Ethides and the Maturidis and the Esharis, they all agree unanimously on the fact that your belief is Kufr. Why? Not only because of your divine simplicity, but because of your divine agnosticism. You can't even attribute existence or being to God. OK, and you try to provide and say you have rational argumentations for the existence of God. You know, this is very amusing to me, Khalil, that you think that you have rational argumentation for God. Well, let's let's look further besides the text that I gave. What about taqlid? Who's the one that ta does taqlid in this situation? Is it me or Khalil? Well, let's listen to Nasr al-Khusram himself. The masters of the truth and the true monotheists are themselves gathered among such believers by convention, by taqlid. He who rejects taqlid never arrives at the discernment of deeper truth. It is by the way of taqlid that one arrives at God's oneness and a grasp of the truth. Taqlid is true, not false. And this is in reference to a refutation of the Mu'tazila, who believed, unlike Khalil, and even though he wants to present himself and his Ismaili creed as such as believers in rational argumentation, they don't believe in rational argumentation. In fact, 
Khalil himself has an article published by Oxford in which he comments on this very same passage. And he says he, Husserl, also proudly declares that no one has been able to, uh, to critique the Moctezilites apart from his group. The people of spiritual inspiration, Nasser begins his critique by first attacking the Moctezilite claim that belief in Tawhid should not be based on Taklid. So he's critiquing the idea that they say it shouldn't be based on Taklid. He does, does so by accusing the Moctezilites of confusing genuine Taklid, which he believes of, is of his imam, with familiarity and habit. OK, so you believe in making taklid as your only way to come and actually know God. You cannot know God through rational argumentation. On the other hand, my friend, I can actually show you that not only does Ibn Taymiyyah allow for rational argumentation, but the very same person who you quoted, which is Dr. Hatim al-Hajj or Sheikh Hatim al-Hajj in this very text, actually mentions this exact same point. So in this text, he says, and I quote, Ibn Taymiyyah did not belittle, uh, did not attempt to belittle the office of reason or deny its importance in grounding our faith in the revelation. He argued that reason is not one undifferentiated category of, ra of conclusive rational input. Okay, and he goes on further in this text, right? So let me let me show you where he goes on further. He says, Ibn Taymiyyah then came at a time when the intellectual idiom of the scholarly community and even of the public space has been saturated with kalam. So he, he decided to engage with it, thus the notion of him being a mutakellim. However, he did not do that in the way contemporaneous speculative theologians did, but rather to defend the Ethery Creed, which found their strongest patronage amongst the Hanbalis. He even explicitly permitted rational theological argumentation at some level and showed that it has first be employed by the Qur'an. So very clearly, most of your arguments and critiques were straw man. Now let's get to this issue of anthropomorphism. I want to remind everyone OK, you guys can listen to what he says about accusations of anthropomorphism. Do you know that Khalil himself, as I have already stated, believes that anyone who believes that God is knowing or has knowledge is an anthropomorphist and guilty of shirk? This is what he believes. So forget about me that I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a yed and he has this and he has that. If you even believe that God is perfect or a cause or any of these categories whatsoever that can be applied to God, you are guilty of shirk. For example, this is from Nasr al himself in the same text that I mentioned, which Khalil has an article on, and I quote, if these theologians, speaking of the Moctezilla, who believed in divine simplicity, listen to what he says about other people who believe in divine simplicity. If these theologians, the Moctezilla, have established that God is knowing, God too calls certain of his servants knowing, as in the verse, only those of God's servants who have some knowledge fear him. Thus, it is clear to call God, praise be to him, knowing is polytheism, shirk. And if these theologians assert that God is powerful, God too calls his own servants powerful. As in this verse, they went early determined on their purpose. This too is polytheism. And if these theologians say that God is living, God too calls his own servants living, as in the sense. And he goes on and on with this. And he says, this is a heresy which this group has invented in their ignorance. They have imposed these names on God. No, my friend, the Moctezilla, even though we don't agree with them, they did not impose these names on God. So this is not a debate over divine simplicity versus divine simplicity. This is against Khalil Ismailism, against the entire rest of the Muslim community, where he says to even say that God is perfect or all-knowing, you are guilty of shirk. So we must reject this false doctrine that he's bringing forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Jake. Um, Dr. Khalil, are you there? Yeah, sorry, give me one second. I just have to share the screen again. Now. So we're going to have 10 minutes right now from uh, Dr. Khalil, and then we're going to have uh, a second round of uh, five-minute rebuttals, and then we'll get into the cross-examination uh, reminder to everybody in the chat to keep it respectful. Uh, our mods are trying to keep up with the chat, but um, uh, can't really get 
everyone. So please, again, keep it respectful and try to listen to what's being said in the debate instead of, like, you know, uh, pointlessly arguing with each other. Um, Dr. Khalil, whenever you're ready, you can go. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jake, uh, for the opening and for the rebuttal. Um, I just want to make it clear, the topic is debating Tawheed, Uthari Creed versus Islamic philosophy, and even if you want to say Ismaili philosophy, which is included, that's fine. But the debate is not Uthari Creed versus Khalil Andani's views over the past 10 years. So let's keep this thing uh, on topic. All right. Now, I gave in my opening statement 10 arguments that completely invalidate the Uthari Creed, five of which positively prove the Tawheed that I believe in. Whether you want to call it Ismaili or Falsify it really doesn't matter. I have I have given positive arguments for my position and arguments against Jake's Uthari position, and Jake has only attempted to answer the first argument that I gave. He hasn't really answered anything else, and he hasn't even given a positive, I want a positive case for why we should believe in the Uthari Creed. That is completely missing. Now, I could find four arguments that Jake gave against my position, uh, and I'm going to try to go through them. Okay, first, Ismaili philosophy is incompatible with falsafa. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, well, before that, let, let me do a different order. Let's go with, start with argument three. Khalil's view contradicts reason. In other words, you can't say anything about God uh, and that you can't use reason to prove God. Jake, that's what Jake said first. Okay, this is actually false. Uh, you are quoting Wilfred Madelung. That article is from 1977. That's like over, uh, that's like th 40 years old. Okay, once we've actually read Ismaili primary sources, Kirmani, Rahat al Akl, Nasr Kusru, Zad al Musafir, Tusi, in the same book you quoted, Tusi gave an argument for God. So, Kirmani, Khusro, Tusi, and even Shahrastani in his refutation of Ibn Sina, they have all used a contingency or dependency argument to prove the reality of God. So, this is completely fine in Ismaili thought to prove God. Uh, we do do that. It's in our primary text. If Madelung wrote that we don't offer an argument, Madelung is simply wrong and that article is outdated. And I say this as an expert who reads the primary sources. And it follows from the fact that dependent realities require an absolutely independent originator in order to exist. This is how we know there is God. And once we know there is God, we further know that this independent, absolutely uh uncaused originator must be simple, eternal, transcending all the attributes of creation. So when we do negation, we don't mean to say you can't say anything about, about God. Kirmani never actually says that. Uh, what Kirmani says is that you have to negate all the attributes of creation from God. That is what you have to do. And this is not a uniquely Ismaili thing. Ibn Sina actually does the same thing. Okay, Ibn Sina says that every positive statement about God refers either to a negation or a relation, idafa. And a relation simply means that something in creation has been created by God. So Are you sharing that, slides, Khalil? I'm sorry to oh. interrupt you because we're not seeing slides. Apologies for the interruption. Yeah. Uh, are you guys not putting my slides up or what? They haven't, you guys haven't put my slides up. Um, in, your, in your opening, in your opening where your slide. Pause the timer. Okay. I'm going to pause yeah. the timer. Yeah. You haven't, I. Uh, in your opening, your slides were up. So are these like a different set of slides? No, no. Okay, is this it here? There. Yeah, yeah. So did you? So you do you want to? Do you want to? I don't know. Do you want to start over? Yeah, I would appreciate that because okay. I thought there was okay. a slide showing. Okay. Okay. So so um, uh, Dr. Javad, if you don't mind, you can restart the timer because I don't really have access to that right now. Okay. Okay, that sounds yeah, good. Go ahead. I'll, I'll restart the okay, timer. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Begin. Yeah. Okay, so as I said, um, this debate is about Tawheed. It's about positions on Tawheed, the Uthari position versus Islamic philosophy. Even if Jake wants to substitute Islamic philosophy for the Ismaili form of it, fine. But we are debating positions. We are not debating whether I personally hold to X or Y. Okay, if you see any modern debate, uh, competitions, many people have to defend positions that they don't exactly hold to. So that's what the debate is about. My opponent's comments about what my personal beliefs uh, are really irrelevant to this debate. Next thing, I gave 10 arguments. Five are positive arguments for my position, and 10 in total are arguments against the authority position. Jake has not given any arguments for the authority position. 
So there's no reason to be an authority so far. Uh, and furthermore, Jake has not dealt with my 10 arguments. He's tried to deal with argument one about logic, but I'm going to come back to him on that in my second rebuttal. The point is you can't just now suddenly appeal to Ibn Taymiyyah, okay? You, when we exchange texts before this debate, I asked Jake, who, which authorities do you follow? He told me Ibn Kudama and Ibn Hamdan, who's summarized in Balbani. I'll show the Facebook messages. I asked Jake whether he takes from Ibn Taymiyyah for this debate. He said no. Okay, now Jake is appealing to Ibn Taymiyyah because I've caught him flat-footed. Now, I found four arguments from Jake, so I'm going to go through them, uh, not in this order. So the first thing Jake said is that Ismailis are not allowed to offer an argument for, for God, and he relied on a 1977 article from Wilfred Madelon. That article is wrong. I have read the primary sources myself. Kirmani proves God's reality. Khusro proves God's reality. Tusi, in the same book that Jay quoted, Tusi gives Ibn Sina's contingency argument to prove the reality of God. So we, Ismailis, we are allowed to do this, okay? And we do use a contingency argument, and we logically follow that contingency argument with the absolute negation of all creaturely contingent attributes from God, okay? That is what our double negation is based on. And according to John Martin, who's a scholar of the Neoplatonic tradition, this type of hyper negation that you do for God, it is logically meaningful. It is not confused and it is not contradictory. This is the academic opinion about Ismaili and Neoplatonic thought generally. It is not logically contradictory. Now, another thing Jake said is that Ismailism... I'm sorry to uh, interrupt again. Abdurrahman, I'm being told that the stream is not working properly. And I've paused. Uh, pause the sorry, timer. sorry. What do you mean by stream? Are you talking about the comments? No, the stream itself is what I'm being told. Okay, it's oh. back now. I guess it's cutting back and forth. All right, should okay, I continue? So, yeah, I, I think you should continue. I'm not going to start time. over. I just paused okay. my own timer. So, so I yeah, I paused the timer too. Okay, so um, yeah, so they're uh, saying that the YouTube went I down mean, for, for 90 seconds. But okay. For 90 seconds. Yes, that's what I'm being told. Um, okay, then we're going to need to confirm that because if it's 90 seconds, then that's a significant part of the, I mean, it's live for me. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, but I'm looking at the stream yard. So um, can we, can we confirm from the comments or something that it went off for 90, 90 seconds or because maybe it was, if it's from one person, maybe it's the per person's connection. Okay. One second. I'm looking into that. So, um, I I look fine from my end, so I don't know what the issue but is. But on StreamYard, I mean, could it be like fine on StreamYard and then like out on I have, YouTube? Or? I have no idea. I mean, it's on YouTube that people are saying that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I I received a few messages as well. Uh, yeah. So um, if you don't mind, uh, Doctor Cleo, sorry. Um, if you can, so that's ninety seconds. So about two minutes. If um, yeah, but is it? We have to confirm. Is it working right now? Right now, it, it's working. Um, sorry, I think one it's second. Working. I think it is. It working. wasn't ninety. Some somebody's telling me it wasn't ninety seconds. It was twenty or thirty seconds for them. So um, I I, I don't I don't know because uh, I mean we've got so we do we have the recording on 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 Streamyard as long as it's been good for us because we've been hearing everything. I'll I'll just I can just start again. I don't know what else to do. Like I, I don't I don't think you should start all over. Okay, but I'm just gonna just... continue. I'm just gonna continue if that's okay. okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So as I said, I made ten arguments. Uh, we are we have not got to respond to these ten arguments yet from Jake, but I'm gonna uh, rebut every single thing he said about me. So the first rebuttal is. Ismaili primary sources do prove God. They do. If Madelung said that they don't, then Madelung is wrong. And this is why you should not be quoting 1977 articles. You should go to the primary sources in Persian and Arabic, read them yourself, and you will clearly find in Karmani's Rahat al-Aql, you will clearly find it in Zad al-Musafir. You'll find it in the same Tusi text that you already uh, quoted uh, somehow against me. Okay. you, uh, Jake, you also said that Falsafa and Ismaili thought are just incompatible. They cannot be brought together and that I have to apostate from Ismailism if I hold any position in Falsafa. And you gave some examples, which I appreciate. So firstly, it is a historical fact that Nasir then Tusi, as a committed Nizari Ismaili Muslim, was also a fail Suf. He also followed Ibn Sina. 
And Toby Meyer writes in an article that Tusi was responsible for the expert coordination of Nizari and Avicennan thought, uh, which was done under the imamate of the Imam Allah ad-Din Muhammad and al And Tusi says there's an underlying harmony of the system. So I've given a counterexample. So this argument doesn't stand anymore overall that falsify Ismailism are incompatible because they were compatible for Nasir and Tusi. Furthermore, I have a quote on my slide from Ibn Sina. What Ibn Sina says here is exactly what the Ismailis say. He first says that God can only be described by negating all similarities from him. We believe this. God has nothing in common with creation. Ismailis believe this. Then Ibn Sina says God's essence is not the same as existence. Okay. And that God's essence should be regarded as above existence. Okay. Folk al wujud. So Ibn Sina's position that God is above existence is actually the same as the Ismaili position. Now, regarding the word necessary being, the term necessary being is an ambiguous term, okay? We can talk about logical necessity, ontological necessity. Aristotle has five definitions of necessity. So when Nasser Khosro uses the term necessary existent, which he does, you have to read the whole passage of what, what he means by necessary existent. Khosro uses necessary existent to mean a being that is eternal and imperishable. Okay, when he says necessary existent, he doesn't say necessary existent through itself. The, the terms be that to he are not present in Nasser Khosrow's text. So he's using the term necessary being the way Thomas Aquinas uses the term, because these terms have different meanings within different systems. Now, you said that I believe that creation is necessary and the Ismailis believe it is a free, free will act of God. Uh, firstly, this is not accurate. Uh, number one, Nasir then Tusi, in his Ismaili text, which I know you've read, so you clearly omitted this fact. Nasir then Tusi says, as an Ismaili, two Ismailis, that creation became necessary and that creation is the first intellect. So you can be an Ismaili and you can believe that creation is logically necessary. Furthermore, despite what Madelung and whoever says, there is no Ismaili text that says God has libertarian free will in the sense that God could have done otherwise. In fact, Sijistani, in a text that you haven't read because you can't read Arabic texts, says very clearly that the will of God is absolutely undivided. And furthermore, Sijistani says that God's will does not choose among opposing alternatives. And if you relate God's will to choosing among alternatives, you've lied against God. Rather, God's will is pure goodness with the manifestation of wisdom. It says he does not decide among op opposing alternatives. God will, God's will is united with what he wills. So for Sijistani, God's will only has one position. That's what he says in the last line here. A perfect well will with a single position. So the Ismailis do not believe in libertarian free will. And they do believe that although God wills creation, God could not have willed otherwise. So there is an agreement on this point. Now, you said that uh, according to the Ismailis, the statement, the essence and the attributes are identical. Uh, it's shirk or something. Firstly, Khosrow is talking about minor shirk, not major shirk. And it's shirk. It's not shirk. Secondly, the hukama, the philosophers say that the meaning of the essence and the attributes being identical, it's not the same as what the Mutazila mean. The Mutazila meant something different. But the philosophers here, I'm quoting a Sunni philosopher, Abhari and Maybudi say that, that the meaning of this is that the necessary existent alone okay, produces effects that other things require an attribute to produce. And he says at the end here, this is based on the denial of the attributes along with the affirmation of their effects. So this is exactly what the Ismaili position is. Now, the only thing close to an argument that Jake gave for the Athari Creed was by saying, oh, the Quran has many names for God and therefore God must have multiple attributes. Here's the problem. Your method that every description is wasf izafa of God is a real distinct attribute within God. This does not follow from the Quran. Okay, this is a hermeneutical assumption that you have not justified. Uh, it Not even mainstream Sunnis follow this. This is like the Jakey method of reading the Quran. Even like Ashari's, Maturidis don't believe in this. If you do apply the Jakey method, if every description in the Quran refers to a real attribute in God, I expect you to tell us that you believe that blowing is an attribute of God. You should tell us that spirit is an attribute of God. Anger, loin, human form, all of these should be real, distinct, eternal attributes of God. And if you deny that blowing is an attribute of God, then your entire uh, line of argument, frankly, uh, goes out the window.
Now, regarding attributes, what when you said, oh, you guys don't, you can't say God is all knowing and so on. Well, here's the, here's the problem, okay? And I already talked about the first part of the slide. The Quran has these predications. Allah is called Alim, right? Allahu Alimun. That we can affirm. But Allahu Alimun does not necessarily mean Allahu Lahu Ilmun, that God has entitative knowledge. So we don't affirm the second part. We interpret Allahu Alimun or Allahu Qadirun and like statements. We, we interpret it as follows. A, we affirm that this is God's reality. B, God is not ignorant of anything. And C, God is the originator of all knowledge. And knowledge is his creation or effect. This is not a violation of logic. There's a type of literary speech in Arabic known as metonymic speech. Okay, In metonymic speech, you can describe the giver or the agent. You can describe an agent by means of something that the agent creates. And you can attribute what the agent creates to himself. Okay, it's like when you have a king who orders an army to conquer a city, we would say the king conquered the city, but the king didn't personally conquer the city. The army under his command did it. This is how we interpret the attributes, uh, uh, statements about God, that the intellect and the soul execute God's command, but what the intellect and the soul affect can still be attributed to God verbally because the intellect and the soul act by God's command. And the Quran is full of these examples. The Quran says God takes souls at death but it's the angel of death who takes souls at death. The Quran says God is the guide, but Muhammad is a guide. The Quran oh, yeah. says God sent down the Quran, but it's actually Gabriel who brought down the Quran. So this is called metonymic speech, and this is how we can interpret everything in the Quran, which cool. from which does, your belief does not follow. Khalil, it's time now. Okay. Is that good? You got your last yeah, yeah. comment? Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. And right now we are going to... Um, we're going to go to, I believe it is, the 15-minute cross-examinations, right? Um, no. And, no. Uh, sorry, five-minute rebuttals. I apologize. Yeah, so it's five-minute rebuttal for Jake. Yeah, two rounds of five-minute rebuttals. No, no, no. One, yeah, yeah, each of us gets five more minutes. It's five minutes, yes, right? Yeah. The second one? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've just confirmed that the stream is going to be okay as long as everything was here on our, like, on StreamYard. Because nothing happened here. We we were all live together so uh that means that it is going to be recorded so um if anybody lost anything right now they'd be able to see it in the recording um so okay. jake whenever you're ready you can you can start okay One second and jake please let us know if you have slides because you didn't have them last time no 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 i don't have slides okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna start now Okay, bismillah. Um, unfortunately, folks, I think for Khalil, he's already given up the debate. Why? Because when I'm attacking his position, his response is, my personal beliefs are irrelevant to the debate. Khalil has said that his own personal beliefs are irrelevant to the debate. Well, I wonder who am I actually debating here? Am I debating some guy named Joe down the street, or am I de debating Khalil and Danny? I thought I was debating Khalil and Danny last time I checked. So if your beliefs are not relevant to the debate, then have a nice day. So I don't know what you showed up for the debate. You've already lost the debate. Now, he's attacking Madlung and, and saying that this is an outdated thing. Well, let me tell you something. This is not just Madlong who, who is making this statement. And by the way, I have a document full of all of these references. If anyone is interested in it after the debate, I will make it publicly available with a link and you can read them yourself and see who is actually accurately representing Ismaili theology and the philosophers. Is it Jake? or Mr. Khalil Andani, and you guys can be the judge of that. I think you'll see very clearly, even by Khalil's own words in his written articles and statements on YouTube, that he is doing a bit of taqiyya here. But I mean, what can I say? I mean, it's par for the course with the person that I'm debating now. Now, he says that his, like I said, he's already given up the debate by saying his position or his beliefs are irrelevant. Now, let me try to respond to, because he did this um, machine gun tactic, I'll try to respond to another one of his arguments. He asked about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are they necessary or are they this or are they that? We believe that they're necessary in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists always with them. 
eternally. He always exists with his attributes, and there's not a possibility in which he doesn't exist without his attributes. And you can ask me more questions about that in the future, and you can go on and say, oh, well, that means that there are multiple necessary beings. Well, no, it doesn't mean that there are multiple necessary beings. We don't say that there are multiple humans in uh, that Jake is multiple humans just because I have multiplicity within me. I'm still one being. We don't say that there are multiple uh, beings within Jake. That's, this is not the language that we use. And this is the whole point. You're saying that I didn't give an argument. I did give an argument. My, my argument is quite simple. Just read the Quran for the first part. Read it and see, is anybody going to come to the conclusion that the universal intellect and all of these other beings that exist are eternal and they have these attributes and God doesn't and he's actually not knowing and he's not perfect. No, they wouldn't. And by your own admission, the Salaf didn't actually believe in it. Only a small version of people actually believed in it, which you tried to hint to in the beginning of your opening statement. Now, this on this issue of proving God's existence, he's saying he's doing it by a contingency argument. Let me read from you from Khalil's own statement about God. He says, Listen, the Ismailis find that idea too limiting. God is beyond existence. So, so the Ismailis will say that you cannot say God is the necessary existence. That's Khalil's own words. You cannot say, and as, it, as an Ismaili, that God is the necessary being or the necessary uh, existence. Now, again, is this only Jake saying this? Now he's saying that Al-Kirmani adopts this uh, position. Well, let's see what Al Kermani actually says. And he, he says, well, I'm just quoting Madlung. Well, sorry, uh, Mr. Khalil, but I trust him a lot more than you. And you keep talking about Arabic, but you can't even pronounce basic words, which I find to be quite shocking. Now, he says here, humans do not and cannot know God except as the quasi divine intellectual image present in the mind. And it is not God. Yet this very notion of God as an ultimate first being of, or first cause is the doctrine of the philosophers. It should be abundantly clear that Al-Kirmani rejected the philosophical concept of God as totally inadequate. God is beyond the cosmic system that he brought into being. It shares nothing within him, nothing at all. The God known to humans is the universal intellect the cause of all causes, the unmoved mover, and the necessary being. So al kermanis God is not the God of the philosophers, according to Paul Walker himself. Now, do you want to throw Paul Walker under the bus and say that his scholarship is out of date too, when you just had him on your YouTube channel less than a couple months ago in which you hosted? And so I don't understand. These are your Ismaili scholars that are translating your texts and doing commentaries on them. But apparently none of them know anything except Mr. Khalil and Danny. So he's throwing his entire uh, theology under the bus. And it's quite unfortunate. Right on the dot. Abdurrahman, you're on uh, mute. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jake. So, uh, uh, Dr. Cleo, you can go ahead whenever uh, you're ready. Jim. And if you have slides, uh, I guess let Jake know. So, uh, yeah, I've just I shared the screen if we can get that up first and then I'll run the slideshow. Your camera's off too, Cleo. Yeah, your, your camera is uh, off. Let's see. There we go. Yeah. So, okay. I have five minutes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, you have five minutes. Yeah. Okay, uh, no, thank you. If everyone could mute. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'll start the timer now. All right. Uh, so um, what Jake did is that he appealed to Ibn Taymiyyah to answer my first argument that the Athari Creed prohibits logical proofs. Now, according now Ibn Taymiyyah, of course, is not the mainstream Athari position. Okay, Ibn Taymiyyah is an outlier. Even Sheikh Yusuf bin Sadiq, uh, who I quoted, who's an Hanbali authority, Athari authority, he said that. Now, here's the thing. I have no problem with Jake wants to use Ibn Taymiyyah. But then when we plan the debate, I explicitly asked Jake, are you going to use Ibn Taymiyyah? Or are you going to use other creeds? And Jake gave me the creed of Ibn Kudama. So here's the thing. If you follow Ibn Kudama, which you say you do, well, Ibn Kudama says that all speculative theology, all kalam, whether it's Ashri or not, is completely prohibited. 
So you cannot use any form of Kalam logical, rational arguments against me in this debate, nor can you use it to prop up your own creed. So your creed cannot be proven by reason and the debate is over, okay? Because debate is for people who are allowed to use logic and reason, which you're not allowed to do. Furthermore, in your Uthari tradition, there seems to be a pandemic against logic. You have all these Uthari scholars like Suyuti passing fatwas condemning logic. And Ibn Salah, passing, who's the head of Dar al-Hadith in Damascus, he condemns logic as haram. So if you want to commit to the Uthari creed, fine, but then don't go around using logic because this is, this is a gross uh, double standard, basically. All right. Now, attributes. Again, I'm repeating myself here. We can say that God is powerful if God is powerful means God is the giver of power. Same for all these other attributes. The attributes as finite realities, as distinct realities, they only exist in creation. And again, Ibn Sina agrees with this. Ibn Sina believes God is simple. And I already showed evidence. So even if this debate is about my personal beliefs, which it is not, every assertion that Jake made about Ibn Sina contradicting Ismaili views, the views I'm defending today are all in, in concordance between Ibn Sina, Ibn Arabi, and the Ismailis. They differ on other things. They do. But those are not the points that I'm defending today. Now, Jake's notion of attributes. He said now that the attributes are necessary, but he didn't specify what he means by necessary. So here's what his own creed says. Now, this book of Ibn Hamdan is in Arabic. It hasn't been translated. And Jake gave me a translation of a muqtasar, a summary of the creed. So I don't know if Jake has actually read Ibn Hamdan, but he's very clear. God is powerful through his power. He's willing through his will. So for the Atharis, God needs these attributes and they're all uncreated. And all of these attributes have causal power. So for the Atharis, okay, the attributes sort of have to join together to form Allah. And frankly, the, what comes to mind with your Athari theology is basically Captain Planet, where all the powers have to come together to form Captain Planet. Now, you made thing about Ismailis are not allowed to say God exists. What you don't, what you have not done, because you didn't read Kermani in the primary source, you haven't read any primary sources that are not translated. Kermani and others who say that God is beyond existence, they actually define what existence is. Let me give you some examples, okay? And you need to tell us what existence also means, Jake. I want to hear your answer. How do you define wujud or ace? Now, if exists is a genus under which you have substances and accidents, then exists is a created category and God transcends existence, okay? And everybody agrees with that. God does not possess existence. God transcends existence if existence is a created genus. Number two, if existence is a non-constitutive accident or arad, which Ibn Sina says and which Kirmani says, then also God is beyond existence. And I already showed Ibn Sina saying that. If existence is predicated analogically through what is called a relative analogy, then the term God exists simply means God is the source or the ground of existence. And this is a, a position that Ismailis do affirm. Finally, if you're using exists in the sense of analytic theology or analytic philosophy, which my opponent seems to like, uh, despite its non-compatibility with authorism, in analytic theology, X exists is just a quantifier. It's not an attribute. So in a normal layman or analytic speech, I have no problem saying God exists. And I have written, you, you say you want to make this about my beliefs, but I have an article where I do, it's actually called like the strongest argument for the existence of God. So if existence is a real predicate or an attribute, then I say God is beyond existence. But if existence is a analogical term for the source of existence or is just a quantifier, then I can say that God exists, no problem. I think that's five minutes. Yes, Abdul Rahman. Yes, that's five minutes. And uh, uh, Dr. Javad, if you could take over the moderating for a few minutes, because I'm going to switch to my phone. So, yeah. yeah, all right. So, um, uh, if you could just take over for a bit. Okay, no problem. Correct. Okay, so we've done the uh, intros, we've done the 10 minute rebuttals, and now we've done the five minute rebuttals. So, now we're moving into the 15 minute cross examination, um, where each side will give the other side at least a minute to answer without interruption. And then after that, it's left up to them. Um, and then after we finish that, then we'll do the 10 minute closing. So we're going to start now with the cross examination. I believe that Jake and I'd like both of your cameras on. OK, fantastic. Uh, can we stop sharing the screen, Khalil? Oh, uh, yes. One second.
Okay. I just removed it. Okay. Your uh, mic sounds a little different. Jake, can you say it again, what you just said? Uh, yeah, check, check. Okay. I guess it's fine now. It's a little bit on the loud side, but that's fine. Okay. Um, and Jake, you're the one who's going to start off with the cross-examination. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put on the timer for 15 minutes. I'll tell you when you can start. Just give me one second. All right. We're going to start now. Okay, Khalil. So is true Tawheed known only through Taqlid of the Imam or through the intellect alone? Well, it can be partly known through the intellect. But to make sure that you get it correctly without ascribing created attributes to God, uh, you may need the guidance of the Imams. Okay, so let me give you a quote here uh, from, from, from your own text here. This is from an intro to Ashah Rastani's creation and command. He says, therefore, God is utterly inaccessible except through knowledge of the imam of the time. Thus, it is only through the imam of the time, who is the manifestation of God's command, that people can find a way to his knowledge. The formula was now straightforward. Knowledge of and practice of faith in the one true God, Tawheed, relies exclusively on knowledge and submission to the imam. In short, Tawheed is incomplete without knowledge of the imam of the time. True and pure Tawheed is the one which is subject to the instruction and guidance of the imam of the time. So this text says that you cannot know that it's exclusively based on the imam. So what's your response? Well, there's a difference between, in, in Ismaili thought, between ilm and marifa. Okay? Ilm at, at Tawheed is what you call the science of Tawheed. And this is what we're actually debating right now. How to properly talk about Tawheed. That's ilm of Tawheed. Okay? But when Shahrastani says this, or when Tusi says this, that you need to go through the imam, that is talking about marifa of Tawheed. Marifa is a more intimate type of knowledge that goes beyond. It is a sort of supra discursive kind of knowledge that's recognized in the Ismaili tradition and in the Avicennan tradition and in the Sufi tradition. So these authors are talking about the Marifa of Tawheed. They're not talking about the Ilm of Tawheed. The Ilm of Tawheed is like all over Ismaili books. That's literally the discussion that you and I are having right now. So you need to differentiate okay. between those two things. Okay, so why does Shahrastani himself in his refutation of Ibn Sina say that God is not known through the intellect, he's known through the fitra, and rejects his contingency argument? Well, that's only one part of it. If you keep reading that same text, Shahrastani does say that contingent things do exist and that they require a muraji a preponderator and that's how he establishes the reality of god so sharistani is not against the contingency argument what sharistani is against if you read the text very closely is ascribing wujud or existence as a univocal accident or attribute or genus to god that is what Shahrastani is against. And insofar as anybody does that, and I believe you do that, then Shahrastani is correct. But if Ibn Sina or Ibn Arabi do not think of wujud when they talk about wajib al-wujud, if they don't think of wujud as an attribute or a univocal genus, then Shahrastani's case would not register against them. So is, is Shahrastani making a false argument? Was he incorrect? Shahrastani is fine because he assumes that wujud is a one-to-one -one univocal genus term. So, But everybody agrees with him. I showed you a quote of Ibn Sina where he said, Ibn Sina said on my slide, right, God does not possess nafs al-wujud. The wujud that is common to created things, Ibn Sina said God doesn't have that wujud. And that's exactly what Shahrastani is saying. Okay, so... The, move on to the next point here. So is the universal intellect the necessary being? The universal intellect is a is necessary being in two ways. Okay, number one, the universal intellect is what analytic philosophers call a modally necessary being. A being that merely exists in all possible worlds is what we call a modally necessary being. So the universal intellect is that. The universal intellect is a necessary being in a second sense because the term necessary being means, you know, what sort of has to exist. It cannot be any other way and it cannot change. 
That meaning, if necessary, being also applies to the universal intellect, just like Thomas Aquinas refers to the angels and other creations of God as necessary beings. What the universal intellect is not, is it is not wajib al-wujud bidatihi. Nasser Khosrow never says the intellect is wajib al-wujud or hasti wajib idatihi. Those, those terms in itself are not present in Nasser Khosrow's text. So you, when you're looking at terminology from one intellectual tradition and another intellectual tradition and even modern analytic philosophy, you have to properly unpack what those terms mean and then map them uh, against each other properly. Okay, so when you say in your YouTube video that God is beyond existence, the Ismailis will say that you cannot say God is the necessary existent. What did you mean? I mean it the way Shahrastani meant it, and in the way if necessary being refers to something that possesses wujud as an accident. And Kermani defines wujud as an accident. Shahrastani defines wujud as a genus. Nasser Khosru defines wujud as a genus. So if those are the meanings of wujud, then surely you cannot call God a necessary being because being is an attribute there. And Ibn Sina agrees with us on this, and so does Ibn Arabi. If wujud has a different meaning, if it only has a negative meaning, that which does not accept uh, Adam, non-existence, if that's what wujud means, then you can say God exists. And in fact, Kirmani, in his own text, Rahat al-Aql, actually says it is permissible to refer to God as wujud or mojud as long as you realize that you're not ascribing a real attribute to him. He says this in Rahat al-Aql. Yeah, in that same text, uh, he is, he actually has a section critiquing the philosopher's conception of creation, and he says, on its existence being from the Most High, may he be sanctified, not by way of emanation, as the philosophers maintain, but by way of innovation, and that seeking to comprehend the manner of its coming to exist is impossible. Likewise, you just brought up the point before about the preponderator, that God is a preponderator of existence. Well, in that same section, Shahrustani says, consequently, the preponderator is a preponderator of, of existence over non-existence, not a preponderator of necessity over contingency, and it is a bestower of existence, not a bestower of necessity. So how do you defend these quotes in light of your modal collapse position? Okay, so the first quote regarding emanation. So firstly, uh, I, I don't know what the perp what, what you're really asking me to defend. Um, Kirmani has a very uh, restricted notion of emanation, which is a material process by which the cause is only perfected if it emanates its effect. That's how Kirmani talks about emanation. Obviously, I reject that notion of emanation, and so does everybody else. Kirmani says creation of the first intellect is by ibda, which is origination. Well, the Ibn Sina tradition also refers to God's creation of the first intellect as Ibda. So remember, Ibn Sina died in 1037. Kirmani died in 1020. There's no way Kirmani is refuting Ibn Sina because Ibn Sina like, hasn't even written his major works when Kirmani is writing. Kirmani is most likely referring to a pre-Avicennan falsafa tradition. And there were falsafa who believed that God creates uh, without any volition. So obviously we reject that. Now, modal collapse. Uh, by modal collapse, you mean that God could not have willed otherwise, right? Is that what you mean? But can you tell yeah. us what modal collapse means? Because the audience doesn't really know. Yes, what you just said. Is that God cannot will otherwise? That's modal Correct. collapse? Yes. Yeah, so well, no what you just said. Yeah, there's no problem with that. Sijistani says this. Sijistani believes God can only have one will and one choice. So this is our. This has always been the Ismaili position. I showed you this on my slide. God is not a libertarian free agent in the Ismaili conception. You have to be careful and not ascribe the Ash'arite notion of a divine will that is entirely self-determined, that, that just randomly picks from a possibility leading to brute contingency. That's the Ash'arite view of divine will, and that's the Athari view of divine will. This is not what any of the Ismaili philosophers believe in. The difference, if any, between the Ismaili view and the Avicennan view uh, is how they articulate the fact that creation could not have been otherwise. And again, modal collapse is not a problem for us. Even if everything other than God is modally necessary, everything other than God is still dependent because, as you said, 
everything in and of itself lacks preponderation for its existence. So God is the preponderator, as Shahrastani says. So even if God preponderates the existence of everything such that everything is modally necessary, everything is still dependent on God. So modal collapse really does not touch my worldview, the Ismaili worldview, or the Avicennan worldview. Okay, so um, question. So does Nasr al-Khusra accuse the Mu'tazila, who believed in divine simplicity, of shirk? based on the proposition that they attribute knowledge or knowing to the divine essence. Okay. So number one, you see, I'm assuming you read the text. Does he tell you which shirk he's talking about? Well, you can't respond with a question. Well, I mean, do you, are you aware? Or you can answer yes or no. Are you aware? You're, of which you're not supposed to respond with a question. Okay, fine. As you said, I'm the amateur debater, right? It's fine. So let me tell you then, okay? Because I don't think you know, because at least you would have mentioned it. So he first talks about a hadith where the prophet says that the presence of shirk in my community is more hidden than an ant walking like on a rock in the middle of the night. So this is talking about shirk khafi, okay? Not shirk jali. There are two different kinds of shirk. Shirk Jali is when you explicitly worship idols, okay? Like what the Meccan Mushrikeen were doing. Shirk Khafi is a shirk that is a problem with creed or doctrine. So Nasser Khosro does say that if you believe in multiple eternal uncreated attributes that are distinct from Allah's essence, you are committing Shirk Khafi. Because he quotes this hadith right before he makes the accusation. So he does say that. And he does say that about the Mu'tazila. But for some reason, you ascribe the Mu'tazila position that Nasir Khusru critiques, you ascribed it to the philosopher. But it's not the position of the philosopher in that text. When Nasir Khusru gave the Tawheed of the philosopher, he actually never said anything bad about it. In fact, you're quoting from a work called Jami al-Hikmatain, the reconciliation or the harmonization of the two hikmas, Hikmat al nabuwa and Hikmat al falasifa That's what Nasser Khosrow's entire book is about saying there is no conflict between Ismaili hikmah, which is prophetic hikmah, and falsafi hikmah. So I don't know how you can quote a book whose main thesis is the compatibility of Ismaili philosophy and falsafa and use that as evidence to say that they're not compatible. Okay, if, if uh, creation did not exist, would God exist? I mean, what, what, like logically speaking or what? Yeah. Well, it would be proper to say that if creation did not exist, okay, God would not exist. But if, if creation does not exist, it would have to assume the non-existence of God. At the so God is dependent upon creation? No, not at all. God, but you God, said he, he, he couldn't exist without creation. I didn't say he couldn't exist without creation. You just said that I said creation could not creation. exist without God. Yeah, but is it the other way around? Could God exist without creation? God exists through himself. Two minute warning. And creation exists through God. Okay, so um, you also mentioned earlier that I was quoting an old article, but let me quote you an article from Frank Griffel, who was actually uh, part of the same text that your article was published in, the Oxford text. He says, given that God is unknowable, and this is a commentary on Shahrastani, given that God is unknowable, the first intel this first intellect is the highest being to which humans can relate. It is the being that the Quran refers to as God, Allah. The God of revelation is not a real deity, but rather the true God's first creation. Additionally, this is the being the philosophers and theologians refer to as God. So he's claiming to represent Ash-Shahristani as saying that the God of the philosophers and theologians is actually the first intellect. So what's your response? Is there a question? You just want my comment on that? Yeah, what's your response to it? Because you're claiming okay. that you believe in the same thing. He's saying that you don't. Uh, again, I would like you to find me, firstly, a primary source. You, you've you been relying only on secondary sources. Frank Griffel. No, that's not whatever. true. Well, it is. Anyway, um, the first part, what Frank Griffel said there, that according to Shahrastani, the God of the Quran is the first intellect. No, there is no Ismaili author who has said that the God of the Quran is the first intellect. This is completely false. Okay. The second part, 
the fact that the, what the theologians and some philosophers take as God is the first intellect, that does apply. That is true in certain cases. And it's not just the Ismailis who held this view. Ghazali held this view. Okay, In his Mishkat al-Anwar, your Imam Ghazali said that the God worshipped by Aristotelians and some of the Mutakalimun is just the mover of the highest sphere. It's not even the true God. And then the God worshipped by some of the philosophers is the first creation of the true God. And it's only the God worshipped by the Sufis, the attainers. That's the true God. So this position, uh, yes, Nasser Khosru does charge philosophers and theologians with this, with this thing. But Ghazali makes the same charge, and I don't see what's remarkable about it. It's that. time. That's time. Okay. So I'm going to reset the star, uh, clock to 15 minutes. And now we're going to switch. Now, uh, Dr. Khalil Andani is going to put Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, in the hot seat. All right. Ready? 15 minutes. Here it goes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jake. Uh, let's begin with attributes and cut to the chase. You hold that God's attributes are distinct, not identical to God's essence. So do the attributes depend on God's essence or are they ase necessary in themselves? What do you mean by depend? Does the existence of an attribute of Allah depend on the essence? In the same way that for you, the existence of creation or God's existence depends on the existence of creation. I just mean either the attributes depend on God's essence or they don't. Which is it? Yes, in the same way that you would say that God's existence depends upon creation. I don't say that though. So I want to clear and so I'm saying yeah, that Yeah, you just said that before. Just I didn't say that. Ago. Well, there, there there's a tape here, so we'll watch. Exactly. So I'm going to take it that you said the attributes depend on the essence to exist, okay? I so didn't say that. You just said that. No, I didn't. Okay, I'm going to ask you again. Are the attributes of Allah are they asay asa or not asay? That's a different question. Are you conflating okay, a, I'm changing the question. Answer my question. Why are you changing the question? Because that's my right. Answer my question. Okay, so what's your new question? I already stated it. Moderator, he's like, he's just evading here. He's not answering my question. What's your question? Are each distinct divine attribute, is it dependent on God's essence or is it ase? Depends what you mean by depend. The divine essence is the necessary and sufficient condition for that attribute. And you're not allowed to ask me a question. I want to answer now, or I'm going to take it that you forfeit the question because you cannot defend your creed. I, I answered you. I said it you depends what you mean it. by depend. You have not answered my question. I'm going to give you one last means. chance. I'm going to uh, give you one more chance. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm able to respond, or am I not? You're not responding. You keep yes, saying I I've am responding. It's, it depends what you mean by depend. Is it that you have a special definition of dependence that I don't share and that you can't proceed with your argument unless I agree with your definition? Is that your problem? Dep you have already used the term depend throughout the process. So you define dependence and you tell me, do the attributes depend on the essence or not? I just told you in the sense that you just said that creation depends on God and I that God depends on creation. Creation depends on. Uh, okay. Okay. Hold on. So just let me, let, let's make some breakthrough here. So creation depends on God. I said that. Yes. Are you saying that the attributes depend on the essence the same way creation depends on God? I'm saying there's a counterfactual dependence. Yeah, that doesn't matter though. So this is irrelevant. Do the, the no, it's attributes, not irrelevant because you asked me about dependence. Are they I say or not? You're not answering the you, question. You asked, you asked me about dependence, and I'm answering you. I'm saying there's a counterfactual dependence okay, of let, one let not existing without the you. other. Let me define it for you. I say creation cannot exist by itself. It can only exist if God first exists. Okay. And is that provides, a counterfactual dependence? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what counter, counter counterfactual dependence doesn't cover this. Questions should be grounding. one way. I'm talking about grounding relations. Okay. God is the ground for the existence of the first intellect. Would you agree that God's essence is the ground for the attributes? Grounding relations are one way. So now you're asking about grounding relations. Is that yes. what you meant by dependent? Yes. Are the attributes grounded by God's essence? In again, in the sense that they okay. cannot exist without the other, but we don't say it's a causal dependency. Or I, causal I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. So you 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 don't said, care what I say. Well, why are yeah, you asking I don't the care question? What, let, I'm next question. Okay, so you said yes, they depend. You you say it's not. No, causal no, I said it's not care. a causal dependency. It, There's no fine. causal dependency. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The it's a counterfactual is, dependency. It, it doesn't matter. 
The point is the attributes depend on the essence. They do not exist on their Only own. Only in the sense that they can't okay. exist without each other. Okay. So the attributes are not ase. What? The attributes are not ase. Is that a question or a statement? Yeah. Well, agree or disagree? In what sense? What do you mean by are the attributes? The, the attributes are dependent on the essence. So they're, they do not have aseity. In the sense that they can't exist without the other. Okay. Good. Now, if something is not ase, can it be God? Sorry? What, can if, you repeat if that? If something is not ase, is it contingent? Anything that's not God, is it contingent? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, so therefore the attributes are contingent. So you believe Why? in contingent contingent because they're not ase. So my question to when you did, is you didn't say ase, you said not God, and then you switched it with ase. I said again, you already said it. Now no, no, you switched it. You just did a bait and switch. I didn't I said are the attributes. You asked me, you asked me if they're if anything other than God is contingent. And I said yes. And then you tried to impute that and say that that means that's referring to the attributes. No. I don't know. I said that. if something is not ase, is it contingent? You said yes. You already said the attributes are not ase. So the attributes are contingent. So your God has contingent attributes. No, not at all. The, the term God itself includes the essence and the attributes. So how are oh. you separating them? Oh, oh, you should have said that before, my friend. We would have saved so much time. Save so, so much time with what you keep. You can't. Yeah, so it seems God, like you're having difficulty. You're okay, having difficulty. I was under the impression that for let, you, let God, Khalil speak. I was under the impression that for you. Yeah, God, I'll let him speak if you ask me a question. Okay, so this God is not is the hookup. essence. God is the essence and the attributes. The and term the God, we don't dis divorce them from each other. Okay, so God is the essence and the attributes. Okay, and the attributes are not ase. So your God has. When did I say that they're not ase? Uh, you said they're not ase. Okay, do you want to you want to say the attributes are ase? I didn't use this terminology. The problem is you keep ch changing this question. You're saying ase, then you're using dependent, then you're it's using the, same the word thing. God. It's not the same thing. is independence. Yeah, it's, you just had a debate with thing. Bo Branson of saying aseity is independence. You just did that, and now you're it's, changing it's, it's, it. So no, it's not able, the same thing. You're, you, you keep changing a, it. Do you change your position whether you debate Bo Branson or me? No, no, no. The me? term God, the term God includes both. So you can't okay. separate them in that Okay, way. thank you for clarifying. So I God, said it three times. Thank you. So God includes an essence and multiple real distinct attributes, correct? God, the term God. Yeah, I'm just repeating what you said. God includes the essence and multiple real distinct attributes. Yes? Distinct in what sense? The attributes are not identical to the essence and not identical to one another. Correct. Okay, so therefore your God is a conglomerate of different entities. Thank you for confirming that. Next, I'm going to move on now. Okay, you just asked me about um, necessary creation, right? So um, here, let me, can I just state my view of what I mean by creation is necessary, and you can comment on it if that's okay? Go ahead. So do whatever you want. My view is this, okay? The will of God is necessary. Every decision choice that God has made could not have been any other way, okay? It's the best possible choice. And any choice God has made, it is impossible to conceive that it could have been other way. This is my position. Is that position compatible with Islam according to you or not? Is that position compatible with Islam in what sense? You're saying, does that make you non-Muslim if you believe no, that? It, does it go against Tawheed to believe? Yes, what it I does. Think. It so goes against believe, Tawheed in the sense that you're saying that God does not have free will, that creation is just ne necessitated by his essence. Yes, that goes against Islam because the Quran and the authentic Sunnah say otherwise. Uh, again, I didn't say necessitated by its essence. I simply said every decision choice that God has made could not have been any other way. And any choice that he's made, it's impossible to conceive that it could have been any other way. That's my position. I, is that compatible with Tawheed or incompatible? I, I take Asajistani's position in, in his refutation of it. Okay, so again, can you answer? Is what I just said compatible with Tawheed? It, God's decision could not have been any other way. 
Is it compatible? Uh, with insofar as I understand you, your position is not in agreement with Tawhid. Okay, so again, every decision or choice that God has made could not have been any other way. That's not compatible with Tawhid. Okay, so if a Muslim that that you knew of held this view, okay, would you um, support their work? Uh, would you promote this? So are you okay promoting this view of God's will cannot be otherwise? Are you okay with that being taught to other Muslims? Depends who it is. A person who believes this is teaching this to other Muslims. Yeah, I would have to speak to them because I can't trust your representation. Well, look, if I believe that God's choice could not have been any other way, you would agree this doesn't meet Tawheed, right? Well, who are we, ta are we talking about somebody alive or dead? I'm just giving you my position first because it, it, I, Five I don't minute know warning. You, you think it's okay or it's not okay to believe God's will could not have been any other way. Yeah, I just want to know because you're talking if I know the person personally. Yeah, you so, know me. I'm I'm telling you my position because yeah, I, I don't I don't believe a, your position is Tawheed because it goes against the text. Okay, so my question for you then is why is it the case that um, you work for someone who has the exact same position of Tawheed on God's will not being any other way as me? I actually just read to you I don't verbatim know what, what I read to you the words of Muhammad Hijab in his London Nia video published six months ago. You can go see it. He literally says what I just said. So Muhammad Hijab is teaching a view of Tawheed that you think is not Tawheed, yet you go and work for the Sapiens Institute. So are can you, you just being it? inconsistent here? Yeah, can I can read it. read it. Quote, go ahead, read it. Go ahead. the will of God, since it's an attribute of the necessary existence, it must also be what? Necessary. Every decision choice that God has made could not have been any other way. Since his wisdom and knowledge is perfect, you couldn't conceive that the results be any other way. It's the best possible choice that could be made. It's necessary. Any choice that God has made, it's impossible to conceive that it could have been any other way. You just said this position is against Tawheed. You work for someone, your Ustad Muhammad Hijab, who preaches He's this not on my YouTube Ustad. Public. He's not my Yeah, Ustad. well, you work for him, so I think you're being utterly <laughs> inconsistent he, about he, he, everything. You're saying he's my employer and I work for him and he's my Ustad? Where he, did he, I say that? Course, you teach for someone who preaches this necessary. Where did I? Where did I ever say that? That you condemn. Where did I ever say that? You just said it's not in line with Tawhid. Oh, you're claiming that he's my ustad. How is he my? It, it ustad? doesn't matter. You work with his institute. It is so because I, you're I, making false statements. I cannot take your Guys, get back on to back on course, seriously. please. I'm sorry. Can I, I can, can I say something? This. Can I say something real quick, uh, Doctor Khalil? If because because this is a bit messy. So if you can keep it to questions. And then, and then Jake, like, let, let him take like okay, okay, well, a let, minute, a minute, an, an, un, an uninterrupted minute, unless Fine. he let's, doesn't uh, need it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's just let's just keep going then. Okay. All right. Um, let us talk about. Do you, uh, Jake, in accordance with your creed, where is Allah? He's above the throne. Where's the throne? What do you mean? Where's the throne? Where it's the, the highest, throne? Point, you point, the highest you, point of creation. Can you point me in the direction of Allah according to your creed? It's the highest point of creation. Can you point with your finger according to the hadith of your creed? Where is Allah? Can you point? Yes, only where in, in, in the same way that Abdul Qadir al Jalani also said the same thing when he can quoted the hadith. Point, it doesn't matter. Uh, am I allowed to? Am I allowed to? Hey, Maz, am I allowed so to actually? I, not, he's not answering my question. Doctor, he's not Doctor answering Khalil, my question. Khalil, he can just say no. I okay, can't point. So, so one second, one second. Let me let me just mod for a second. So I think um and and Dr. Javad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think before we came on, we agreed that in the cross examination, the person who answers is going to get an uninterrupted minute. Now the issue is, I mean, clearly you're probably not going to agree with his answer but i mean it's not like one interrupted minute if you accept his answer no, me, it's just I, I have one limited uninterrupted time minute. and he's 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 evading my question yeah the I timer is stopped but, but, but no Khalil, Dr. i answer Khalil, all this, of his this, questions he's not no, answering Khalil, my questions Dr. he's Khalil, evading my rule, questions this one minute rule Khalil, was you proposed, seem very frustrated, proposed it was proposed by me it, sorry it was proposed by you so i mean i'm not so it's not that uh, Actually, clearly, you can proposed, disagree with it. It was proposed by Jake. Okay, so what shall oh, we fine, do? That's fine. That's fine. What I mean is, just try to keep it to questions. Uh, clearly, you sure. can like, say okay. something that's not so, a question. How, but then okay. ask a question and then let how him much, answer. How Once much time? Done, you can come in. So you how have two time? minutes. So you have two minutes and thirty seconds. I would say, okay. just in uh, Khalil's defense, that I think there should be an attempt made to actually answer the questions. 
Um, but uh, I yeah, am so, actually so, attempting to answer the question. No, but do, do, Dr. Javad, okay, so so yes, of yeah, course. You of should course. stay but in then, your place. But then it's also possible. It's also possible to ask for clarifications on the question. So like that's that's not that's not an issue. Now clearly, okay, we're not supposed to take sides here. We want right. to be neutral. But I I'm just pointing out that uh, Dr. Khalil, if you could keep it to questions, that would I mean that's what the cross examination is for, and it would move more smoothly. And he can respond in. Uh, as long as he stays within the minute, he can say whatever he wants. And if he asks for a clarification, it could simply mean that he doesn't understand the question or that the question requires a further clarification. There's no issue with that, right? So so let's just keep it that way so it can just run smoothly. And I hope you stop the timer, Dr. Javad. Um, uh, yes, that's, Dr. that sounds all good to me. And uh, okay. Khalil, I think you made your point about Muhammad Hijab, but we don't need to keep litigating that. So um, let's start again at two minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to restart it right now, okay? Please continue. Okay. Are you able to point me in the direction of Allah's throne? He's on mute. So. Sorry about that. Um, yes, we can point to it. Alhamdulillah, just as Abdul Qadir al-Jalani stated earlier when he quoted the hadith, which you also mentioned, where the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, approved the belief of the girl when he asked her, where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And she pointed to the heavens. Okay, can you point where is Allah right now? Yes, we can. Yeah, can you do it with your finger? Yeah, we point up. Okay, so Allah is up. Okay. Uh, Allah. You asked uh, about is, the throne. Yes, it is. Okay, is the throne below Allah? No. When did I say that? The throne I'm is not. I'm asking you. No, the throne is not. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the throne. This is what I said. Is the throne below Allah? Yes. The throne is below Allah. I just said that, yeah. Okay. Uh, is the lowest heaven below the throne? Is the lowest heaven below the throne? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. So do you affirm that Allah, per the hadith, descends every night to the lowest heaven? Yes, I affirm Nuzul because it's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet. Okay, so then do you affirm that Allah descends from above the throne to below the throne? He never leaves the throne. But I okay, believe but that he descends. Yes, it's a real descent of Nuzul, which is mentioned in the text. Okay, what's the meaning of a descent here? Because descent means to go from above to below. So what does Nuzul mean? Yes, we understand it in the plain meaning, which is mentioned in the hadith. If I had it in front of me, I can read it, but it's very clear. I think everybody knows what descent means. So you affirm that Allah descends from above the throne to the lowest heaven below the throne? Without entering his creation, yes. Okay, but he does move then from above the throne to below the throne. I, did I mention anything about movement? Well, you I don't said think everybody I knows anything about movement. Okay, what is the meaning of descend that everybody knows? I just explained it to you. So no, you can explain it again. I'm dumb. Explain unfortunately, that's time, even though this got really well, interesting. Yeah, let him answer the question. You right. can have 20 seconds, uh, Jake, if you'd like. Explain it again. What's the meaning of Nuzul that everybody knows? Yeah, so I, I explained it, and Ibn Taymiyyah, which you said that I couldn't appeal to, which I don't know why. All I told you was I don't agree with him on every single position, and that's certainly fine. But when it comes to the Usul, I agree with him. And the fact of the matter is, he explains this. He talks even about the spirit coming down and the angels and this type of so-called movement, which we cannot really understand. And he compares that to the nuzul or descent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says the difference in that is exponentially greater. Therefore, we cannot understand the kafiyah. We don't have enough knowledge on it. We stick to the text and what it says, and we don't dwell on the kafiyah. Okay, right. thank you. Just like we can't understand the kafiyah of Trinity. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're moving on to the 10-minute closing. <laughs> um, since you guys don't have a free discussion period, I don't think. So, um, unless you want it. <laughs> All right, so we're doing the 10-minute closing. Uh, is Jake still going first on the closing? Yeah, okay. Jake, uh, let me know when you're ready. Do you have slides that you'd like to share? Um, no, just give me one second though. Sure, um, let me know when you're ready. Yeah, one second. Um,
Okay, and this is uh, 10 minutes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, you can begin. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in namma ba'd. Now, this debate has been very interesting. I really did enjoy it. What we saw from Khalil is him admitting defeat in the debate. He said he didn't actually come here to defend his own personal views. And why? It's because I've exposed him. And as a charlatan, quite frankly, that he is, because he goes on these public platforms and tries to present himself in an academic fashion and tries to tell people that all of these different creedal positions agree. He tried to even claim Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and mention that when he's the one that actually mentions the hadith of, of the one that you were just questioning me about, and he affirms it without any problem. So he's not on your side. The fact of the matter is, for Khalil himself, his understanding of divine predication and in his classical text is that God cannot be known through the intellect alone. I've showed this over and over again. I showed that Khalil himself affirmed taqlid in order to know the oneness of God in his own article. I recommend that people go and read it just for that purpose. Otherwise, you know, you deal with it yourself. But anyway, go and read that text yourself. As I said, I have all these references that I can demonstrate for a fact everything that I'm saying. What Khalil has done is he said, I only quoted secondary source material. No, I quoted primarily primary source material. And then I showed secondary source material agreeing with my interpretation of the text. And all of them agreed. Griffel agreed. Madlung agreed. Even your own text from Mr. Uh, Muhammad Poor in this in introduction, Paul Walker agreed. All of these scholars who are, by the way, represented by Khalil's own organization, the Institute of Ismaili Studies, he wants to talk about me, that I'm disagreeing with Muhammad Hijab, which shout out to my brother. He's saying that I'm disagreeing with him. I'll have a talk with him and see what, what he was explaining there. I don't really know. I haven't read it. But regardless, you are disagreeing with all of your own Ismaili scholars who translate these texts that are published by the Institute of Ismaili Studies and which are confirming secondary sources are confirming Jake's interpretation of the text not Khalil's interpretation of the text. Again, Frank Griffel in the article mentioned earlier says, Ashaharistani rejects Ibn Sina's basic distinction into necessary by itself and contingent by itself. And subsequently, he also rejects that the proof that Ibn Sina tried to build on. So you're trying to use Ibn Sina's proof and yet Shaharistani and your own scholars reject it. In the section on the true choice, he clarifies that one does not need philosophical proofs for God's existence because the creator is too well known to exist to be pointed to by anything. And the recognition of him exalted as he is through immediate knowledge, fitratin, or innate disposition in a way that one would not need to formally argue for. Again, Paul Walker in his book on the Ismail Ismaili Hujja al-Kurmani states, and I quote, in his way of arriving at Tawheed, al-Kurmani will run the, through the proof offered by the philosophers. So he says he does do that concerning the first being, first cause and necessary being, wajib al-wujud. And then note that the resulting end of the causal series is, despite its primacy in that series, what? Still a part of that series. The end is intellect, the first intellect, not God, close quote. So in classical Ismaili theology, God cannot be known through reason, and the necessary being is not God, it is the first intellect. Yet Khalil states the opposite. So we have a formal announcement to make that Khalil and Dani has apostatized from the Ismaili faith, and hence probably why he didn't want to debate under the title of the Ismaili faith. Why? Because he's representing the methodology and the positions of the philosophers rather than his own Ismaili faith. And it's really a shame. I mean, there's so many points that can be addressed. Unfortunately, Khalil used uh, machine gun tactics, and there's so many points that I didn't have the time to address, but I'd be happy to do so at another time period. Also, as I said, for Khalil, 
God is not the necessary being. So this, despite his protestations to the contrary of him claiming that he can prove that God exists, not only can he not prove that God exists, he already lost a debate because of the fact that he cannot even speak about his God. Every single time that he opens his mic about God, he cannot say that he even exists. He cannot say that he's a cause of anything. He cannot say that they're depend that anything is dependent on God. He cannot say that God is all knowing. He cannot say that God is all powerful. And for Khalil, his God only has the power to perform one action. He cannot do anything else besides that. Okay. Not only that, as I mentioned earlier on the rule of one, which he said he believes in the rule of one, Asajistani has a whole wellspring to refuting the rule of one when he says, and I quote, the 37th wellspring on conceiving a plurality from a single cause, namely the command of God, wisdom dictates that from, from the pure one, there is a plurality. If there were from one, only one, by means of what thing would this plurality appear? One is not other than one in respect to being one, and a thing cannot be the cause of itself. If we were to hold that from one, one appears, and one is not other than one, it is therefore the one and not something other than itself. So he's explicitly refuting the doctrine of the rule of one, as Sajistani, who was a hujja of the imam, who Khalil himself on Twitter said that he is representing the theology of as Sajistani and Nasrul Khusra. And I'm bringing you their primary sources where they are clearly refuting Khalil, both in methodology and his positions. So the fact of the matter is he's not an Ismaili and he has apostatized from his faith. And that's why he wanted to debate under the banner of quote-unquote Islamic philosophy. But the fact of the matter is, I want to instruct all of the listeners there to actually pick up a Quran, whether you're Muslim or not, go and read it for yourself. And you tell me, would you ever come away with the beliefs of Khalil Andani, of three eternal beings, God, the universal intellect, and the universal soul? Would you ever come to that belief without somebody telling you taqlid of the imam, that you're supposed to believe it. No, you wouldn't. And the Salaf al-Salih never believed in this uh, belief that he's presenting. That's why he's willing to throw the Sahaba, and it's no surprise because of the fact that he is Shia, let's just be honest, he's willing to throw the Sahaba under the bus and say they never understood God, they never knew God whatsoever. But yet Khalil Andani is coming here in 2022 with his Harvard degree to try to tell us that everybody just misunderstood God in the early centuries. Nobody understood him until these Neoplatonists came along to tell us that we can't even read or basic uh, understand the basic text of the Arabic when Khalil himself cannot. I mean, he, he cannot even, he's trying to correct me on Arabic and yet every single time he talks, I don't know if he's speaking Persian or gibberish. I don't know what he's speaking. So, the fact of the matter is, Khalil came unprepared for this debate. He thought that this was merely going to be a debate on divine simplicity versus a rejection of divine simplicity. No, I showed and demonstrated that his own position and methodology is internally contradictory. He cannot defend his Ismaili beliefs, and that's why he said he was not here to defend them. But Khalil and Danny, I'm debating you. I'm not debating Dr. Javad or anyone else on the panel or even anybody else listening. I was debating you, and you failed to actually bear your burden burden and actually defend your position. Now, the position that we hold to, which is established by the early Muslims, which is based on a simple reading of the text of the Quran and Sunnah, and everybody, if anybody wants to know about my rational argumentation, I provide rational argumentation all the time for things like the contingency argument, because Ibn Taymiyyah has a whole section refuting the contingency argument of Ibn Sina and actually endorsing his own version of the contingency argument, and he accepts it. Unlike for Khalil and Dan who is using the contingency argument when there is an entire text written by Ash-Shahrastani who he defends as an Ismaili who denounces Ibn Sina's argument and says anybody who uses it is gone astray. And he compares Ibn Sina's God to a trinity. So Khalil wants to compare my God to a trinity, a stalk for the law, which he's obviously not. Yet the position he's claiming to define and defend, sorry, of Ibn Sina, his own scholars condemned as poly 
polytheism and said that this is anthropomorphism. So don't worry about his claims. Listen, if you are a Muslim or a non-Muslim out there and you believe, even as the Tesla did, which he admitted they were accused of anthropomorphism and polytheism by Nasr al-Khusral, you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowledge, uh, knowledgeable or all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect, and all the attributes that you are known about God, whether you're Muslim or otherwise, according to Khalil's own theology, you are a polytheist. Therefore, you should not support him whether you agree with divine simplicity or not. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, I'm going to stop the timer, restart. Uh, you, just give me one second here. Okay. Um, Khalil, Dr. Andani, you ready? Here it goes. Are you, let me know when you're ready. And I'll begin if you want to turn your camera on. And are you using slides? Sorry, give me a minute. My my screen isn't loading. Just give me one second. I need to get the, get this thing up. Give me a second, okay? Sorry, it said that the slideshow is no. I just have to restart the the program here. So it comes up. Okay. Uh, wait. Okay, hold on. Screen share. Let me screen share. All right, if you can put that up first. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this debate. Uh, thank you, Jake. It was a very uh, entertaining uh, debate. Um, I was quite entertained by everything you shared. Uh, so let me just state at the outset why I did this debate. Uh, I don't plan to be a, a career debater uh, like you. Um, so I'm sure you'll have plenty more debates and you can, you know, really get some practice on defending uh, your creed because, you know, God knows you need it. Uh, I in participated in this debate because in, in for some unprovoked reason last December, uh, Jake, the Muslim metaphysician who had been a Sunni Muslim for just two years at that time, uh, and who had just heard about Shia Ismaili Islam, just decided to start um, calling our worldview and Neoplatonism generally uh, kufr and shirk. And he takfirred uh, a whole bunch of us, not just Ismailis. He takfirred anyone who believes in a Neoplatonic worldview. Uh, and um, because Jake is actually a very smart individual uh, who deserves a response, unlike some of the other trash that's out on YouTube, where some people are, they just, they're not very smart. But Jake is actually an intelligent person. Uh, and frankly, I have to give him credit. He's very honest about what he believes and what he thinks is right. So because of Jake's um, capabilities, uh, his intellect and his honesty, I made an exception to my policy of not debating and I decided to debate him. So that, that's why I'm involved with this, because I think if some if an intelligent person is going to make comments uh, about the worldview I hold, then I need to ensure that uh, there is a correction due uh, when appropriate. Now, um, Jake throughout the debate has tried to isolate my beliefs as a Ismaili beliefs, but then he's also said that my beliefs are not Ismaili beliefs. So there seems to be a logical problem of the takfiri going on here. He needs to decide, is Khalil an Ismaili or not an Ismaili? Here's the thing. The worldview I've defended today is on the screen. I've defended that Allah is absolutely simple without real distinct attributes. I've defended the first intellect as the first creation, and I've defended the first intellect as the intermediary for all other creations. This is the worldview that I'm defending. All Ismailis believe this, and all the people, all the names on this screen believe this as well. Okay? And it's a big tent. Neoplatonism, in the sense of the worldview that I'm defending today, goes way beyond the Ismailis. And just because this worldview is common to Ibn Sina, Ibn Arabi, even some Hanbali Sufis. Uh, by the way, Abdul Qadir Jilani in his text, Kashf al-Asrar, specifically says that the first intellect is the first creation of God, that it contains uh, the universals of everything, and that the entire universe has been created from the first intellect. Abdul Qadir Jilani says this in his own work. That's why his name is there. So Neoplatonism or Hikmah is a big tent. This is not just an Ismaili phenomenon. And this is a common polemical tactic to people who 
uh, espouse certain Salafi uh, Takfiri ideology, what they try to do is they try to isolate minority communities and make it seem that nobody believes in their worldview except them. And, and it's quite the opposite here. The Neoplatonic worldview is quite vast. So this is what I was aiming to defend, the entire Neoplatonic worldview. Do I hold the Ismaili version of that? Yes. And nothing you've said in this debate has actually shown that I've departed the Ismaili account of Neoplatonism. I'm going to show you why. But let's get back to the fact that this is a debate between the Uthari creed and Islamic Neoplatonism, even if you want to call it Ismaili Neoplatonism. So it's a debate, and both sides have to give arguments in the debate. So I gave 10 arguments, and you're calling it a machine gun approach because you are utterly unprepared for what I had to show you today. You have not actually gone through the primary sources of your own creed or my creed and actually seen the different type of discourse that's there. This is the problem. I'm actually astonished why Jake, who frankly is a very, very smart guy, Okay, like I have to hand it to you. You are very good at philosophy. You're a very clear thinker. I enjoy, you know, watching some of your other videos. I really do. Uh, you're very smart. And it's just beyond me why you picked the Uthari Creed. It has like the least defensible positions. So I like, frankly, um, I've offered these 10 arguments against the Uthari Creed. Uh, and you, did, you didn't really respond. So I, I'm going to grade you, okay? I'm a professor and I grade people, okay? So uh, let's grade your response. So philosophical Kalami arguments are forbidden for Uthari's. This is a historical fact. You appeal to Ibn Taymiyyah. Um, I'll give you a D minus on that, okay? Because for this debate, you said you follow the creed of Ibn Kudama and Ibn Kudama, as well as the followers of Ibn Kudama today, they say philosoph philosophy, logic, this is not allowed in the madhab. So you had to go outside the Athari creed. So I'll give you a D minus. Um, number two, anthropomorphism of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. You had nothing to say about that. So I take it you can see you concede the point. You get an F. Um, the problem of tafweed, you had nothing to say about tafweed. In fact, you change your view. You said you commit to tafweed via Facebook message, but today you said you commit to the apparent meaning, which is worse than tafweed. So you get an F, okay? And same for all the other tafweed. Now, you did appeal to mystery, so you fall into argument five. You said, we don't know how God descends. It's incomprehensible, but we believe it. Well, congratulations, you've appealed to mystery. And uh, you are no different from the Trinitarian Christians that you like to debate. So for any Trinitarian Christian watching this, remember what Jake has said today. He says, God is above his throne and he descends in some incomprehensible way. And we don't know how. Okay. So now every Christian can say God is three persons, one essence, and we don't know how. The actual positive arguments you offer, I gave, you had like nothing to say about these arguments. So I'm giving you Fs on most of them. You did try to answer number eight. I'll give you a D minus for trying. I like giving participation marks as well. But really, everything was an F. Now, your arguments against me, let it be on the record for everyone watching. I rebutted everything you said. You first said Ismaili philosophy is incompatible with falsafa. Uh, I rebutted this. I showed you that 2C harmonized them. So it does not necessarily follow that they're incompatible. I also showed how some of Ibn Sina's views on God being above existence are actually affirmed by him and agreed with us. I showed how Sijistani is actually a necessitarian on God's will. He's not a libertarian. So me being a necessitarian is actually in accordance with the Ismaili philosophy. You said Sijistani refuted the rule of one. You know, this is a rookie mistake. You, if you read that text properly, when Sijistani said that one cause can give rise to a multiplicity, that one cause is not God. The one cause is God's command. And in fact, the Ismailis do affirm the rule of one. They just have a Pythagorean version of the argument. You said I contradict the Quran and that anyone who reads the Quran will come to the other review. That's completely false. You have no consistent theory of predication. I have a theory of predication called Kinaya or metonymic speech. God is knowing means that God is the originator of knowledge or whatever X he's predicated with. Um, you said repeated that Ismailis don't use rational proofs to establish God. They do. Go read the primary sources. Stop relying on secondary sources like Griffel and Madelung and Walker. Pick up Kirmani's Rahat al akl read it in Arabic. There's an entire chapter to establish God rationally. And he uses a dependence argument, a dependence argument, which is different from Ibn Sina's. And I, I use a dependence argument. I don't use Ibn Sina's continuously argument personally. Um, regarding Taqlid, Ismaili's texts are full of rational arguments. So when it comes to metaphysics, we don't actually do Taqlid. You actually prove the metaphysics. So overall, I've shown 
here we have two competing visions of Tawheed, okay? The vision of Islamic philosophy is very simple. God is one, God is simple, God is beyond time, God is beyond space, God creates everything, but creation unfolds through intermediaries. And the Hadith talks about the intermediaries. The pen is the first creation. We call it the intellect. The tablet comes after the pen. We call it the soul. The Athari Tawheed, frankly, is a big mess. Okay, it has God with all these multiple finite attributes that are somehow floating around. My opponent doesn't want to even answer the question whether the attributes are dependent or independent. It's a huge mess. And he really had no answer to deal with the logical problem of the Uthari. Do you take the Zahiri meaning of God appearing as a beardless youth with curly hair? Do you affirm it, Jake? Or do you do Tawil? Well, you can't do Tawil, so you have to affirm it. And if you affirm it, Tawheed is, Tawheed is finished. If you don't affirm it, you're in a logical contradiction. So it's really too bad. And, and I'm not going to personalize the rest of this debate because, look, Islam, contrary to what like what people want to say today, Islam is a big tent. Islam is extremely diverse. We have so many legal schools in Islam. We have so many theological schools. We have so many Sufi tariqas. And the Ismailis are part of this Islamic diversity. So are the Atharis. And as a Muslim, I do not say that the Athari belief, although I disagree with it, I do not say it is kufr. I will never takfir the people who are Atharis or Salafis or anybody. I will not do that. I may have disagreements with you, but Jake, I don't think you're a Kafir. I think you're a Muslim. Uh, I think your beliefs are misguided, but that's okay. I will treat you like a Muslim, and that goes for anybody. So my position is that if you affirm the Shahada, you're a Muslim. Uh, and it doesn't matter what we disagree on. So we need to keep this in mind. But let me close. Jake says, you know, I'm an Ismaili. So yeah, I'm an Ismaili. Here's what the Ismaili Imams say. They say... That we pray that God in his infinite mercy will forgive the sins of all Muslims. Okay, We b recognize all interpretations of Islam other than our own as, quote, equally earnest endeavor to practice the faith in Allah and emulate the example time. of the Holy Prophet. This is what the Ismaili time. Imam Shakri al Husseini said. Khalil, time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Abdurrahman, are you there? Yeah, uh, so... Um... I, I guess that's uh, that's it for the debate. Thank you both, uh, Jake and Khalil. I enjoyed the discussion. It was um, reasonably civil. <laughs> I appreciate that, and uh, and I and I really enjoyed the back and forth. Uh, thanks to Dr. Devab for uh, joining us in moderating, and I thank everybody else who was watching. We should be having a stream coming up in about two weeks or something, and we'll announce that soon. So everybody. Um, just keep an eye out for that. And um, I guess we'll end it right there. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. Jake, uh, I guess you can end the stream right there. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.